introductory talk, the importance of this whole webinar or the importance of antenatal care. In fact, I think I should say that this talk is just to re-emphasize or remind all of us to keep doing the good work we already are doing. That is, we all obstetricians are basic work. Birth is a rite of passage, a natural part of life. And so this antenatal care is all about giving information to them, enable them to make informed decisions about their care. And any intervention, women, their partners and families should be treated with respect and dignity. And any intervention should be beneficial and acceptable and it has been mentioned in almost all uh, the guidelines, whether it is WHO or the international uh, other standard guidelines. It should be a woman or family centric. So the views, beliefs and values of woman, her family all need to be sought to and respected. But myths and ignorance on one side versus too much knowledge, we have to balance them too. It's all about giving a positive pregnancy experience and antenatal care, it's not so complex. It's to assess, as in terms of taking a detailed history, the first ANC visit is the foremost one where we go for a detailed evaluation, history, examination, in, and basic investigations, what are relevant for this patient, and support them further with uh, iron, folic acid, calcium supplementation, immunization, guide them their further visits, birth preparedness, and maybe the additional care is needed for the ones who are at risk. Or maybe here the baby at high risk or the mother at high risk or both at risk. So yes, parts of it continue like an enigma, like the recurrent pregnancy loss, one with a bad obstetry history, pregnancy with complex medical disorders. These are all like, you know, complex, uh, you know, path when you look at the adenatal care. But the basic is not that complex. So the high risks need to be identified and the low risk need a follow up. Yes, the follow up is needed because the low risk is going to turn high risk any time. So what is the right time to start this ANC care? We all unanimously will say that it is a preconceptional visit, the best one. But this happens only to the couple who plans pregnancy, majority are unplanned. And hence for them, we may have to plan as, or maybe plan their visit as soon as they get to know they are pregnant. Now, uh, the importance of this preconceptional is like, we can optimize their medical situation if they have any, and hence go ahead with the pregnancy in the control settings. Is any downside for this? Many are aware of their situation. Some may, you know, like excessive fear. Some may opt out of the whole situation. Some go through this with very undue fear. And another downside, the many, maybe the clinicians also contribute. Like we mix up with the fertility test with this preconceptional antenatal care visit. So is it needed? Or maybe the couple also, you know, have a um, error in thinking that the fertility evaluation is a, you know, is a kind of, you know, uh, planning pregnancy. So this we need to understand and differentiate and maybe, you know, uh, if we if we mix this up very early, then they understandably land up in fertility treatments also very fast. What is the aim? It is all about a healthy mother and healthy baby and that too, if possible, in the natural process or in government guidelines or in the statistics guidelines, it is all about bringing down the maternal mobility and maternal mortality reduction as well the perinatal mobility and mortality reduction. So why these, all these mortalities are linked so much? Why the government is after it? Why a woman care or a newborn? I mean, there are many who are, you know, like can be left. So why these people are very much important? Because the GDP or the nation or the, you know, the economy has very much linked to all these mortalities. So look at uh, what uh, the uh, goals of, you know, uh, proposed by UN uh, Millennium Development Goals. So here in 2015, 
uh, this proposal, as in the target was kept for 2015 regarding reducing the child mortality as well as the maternal health improvement. So the point number five, this was something like reduce the maternal mortality ratio with a target of 2015 to as near half from 1990 and also give reproductive access to every woman. So the, this was the UN Millennium Development Goals. And as you, with this project, the WHO and uh, Ministry of Family of Health Welfare Government of India has you know, put up this minimum four ANC visits, early registration, first ANC in first trimester and some guidelines. So was it enough? Then came the sustainable development goals. So here point number three is this good health and well-being of which the point number first of that third, the subdivision first is all about maternal mortality ratio. And we are supposed to bring it down less than 70. So this is by the year 2030, we are supposed to bring it down. So WHO, World Health Organization has brought this new guidelines in 2016. It is all about bringing a positive pregnancy experience. And with this, they have, uh, you know, instead of that four minimum ANC visit, now they have brought up this uh, eight minimum eight ANC visits. So of which uh, the first trimester, then at 20 weeks, then at 26 weeks, then after this, you know, the third trimester, 30 weeks, 34 weeks, and then two weekly follow up, they highlight that this minimum eight ANC visits is bringing down the perinatal morbidity a lot. At least one USG in a developing or an underdeveloped place that is before 24 weeks to estimate the gestational age, improve the gestation, the fetal anomalies, multiple pregnancy, reduce the induction of labor for post pregnancy in our Indian setting, at least one before 20 weeks or 24 weeks as the time evolves. A full blood count if the settings are good or at least a hemoglobin midstream urine culture if the settings are good and yes, a, at least a gram staining midstream urine. Also, they highlight identifying hyperglycemia in pregnancy, whichever test we do and counsel them regarding the healthy eating, being physically active, daily oral iron and folic acid supplementation, and areas with low calcium intake, oral daily calcium supplementation has been recommended for uh, a better uh, reduction in the prevention of uh, preeclampsia incidence. Looking at Indian statistics, so with this uh, UN Millennium Development Goal, National Health Mission has kept this uh, goal of you know bringing down the national health mortality rate to 100. Ours was 254 in the year of 2004, uh, and then uh, the target of you know 2017 was uh, around 100. And here, I think the total Indian uh, 2014 to 2016 it has been to 130. Look at the Kerala statistics, it is at 46 and Maharashtra somewhere at around 61. So yes, we are below the sustainable development goals of 61. And is this the latest? No, we have a new statistics at February 2021 where the statistics of 2016 and 2018 survey has come out. Here the Indian statistics is 113. Look at Kerala, the lowest maternal mortality rate that is 43. And uh, the uh, the bad state the bad mortality statistics are in the you know uh, northern or uh, these states where it has been 215 and 197 and look at Maharashtra so this is here at 46 so congratulations to all of you as in all the Maharashtrian Maharashtra people you know who are working here they have worked hard in the so many years and bringing down this maternal mortality rate this so Maharashtra is scoring the Second lowest maternal mortality rate. So big clap to all of us, all of you. So again, sustainable development goal less than 70. So it is all about maternal mortality rates. Looking at the, the, the international statistics, this is of 2018. Sweden, the lowest almost with a four maternal mortality ratio. So maternal mortality ratio is about the number of deaths per one lakh live birth. So in Sweden, it is as low as four. And in US, it is uh, somewhere near 16. So yes, we still have a way to go ahead. These are the still the reasons, hemorrhage 
and uh, hypertensive disorder, sepsis, these are still the reasons for this maternal mortality. I think these indicators we are all familiar because these are the indicators which we fill in every month to the NMMC statistics every month end. And both National Health Mission is working towards uh, this. So different projects have come up. Suman, Surakshit Madhritu Ashwasan. So in which zero preventable maternal and newborn deaths and high quality of maternity care delivered with dignity and respect. Yes, the concept is very good. We are familiar with this Pradhan Mandri Surakshit Madhritu. But in Navi Mumbai, it was more like completing a paperwork. Some of us are relieved with the fact that it disappeared. So the concept is good. This need to be delivered in the places which are really needed. And other different projects are there. Uh, Dakshata, uh, uh, Jenny Suraksha Yojana. These are all intending at the improving the maternity welfare. This project called Dakshita, this is about empowering the healthcare workers. There are many areas of India still with very bad mortality rates. I do empathize the healthcare workers of those places. We may think we can do wonders there, but it is definitely a mammoth task, especially in the absence of urban comfort. This Lakshya program, this is again like uh, bringing the uh, uh, Dakshita was about empowering the healthcare workers, the providers. This is about making the uh, you know healthcare facilities better, be making a better infrastructure there. And we are familiar with this uh, entity, this Manita. So this is about government of Maharashtra and Foxy has brought the private sector hospitals to make an improved quality of maternity and newborn care services. So we were looking only at the mortality, mortality word. So this program is familiar and our seniors uh, are, you know, pioneers in this too. So in the government sector, it was all about, you know, bringing down the mortality. So it is not just about mortality. It is about improving the quality and hence the morbidity can also be very much brought down by better training of the providers and by better standards. This Foxy focus, Foxy has almost brought up the situation like an international standard. And this is proposed, this Adkhud Madhritua has been proposed in 2019. There are some nine components here. So rather than just a scientific basis, they have added some divine components also here. Divine touch to it, yoga, exercise, Garbhasanskar. Uh, so all these nine components the basic things are still remaining like the preconceptual counseling diet nutrition antenatal care immunization birth preparedness postpartum care all these things being emphasized in the nine months window of opportunity now coming to the spectrum which we are delivering we are on one side a group of people like this or the ones who are next to them or behaving like they are next to them. And the other side, this. The same way the facilities are also different. So is it fair to differentiate the antenatal care between the urban and rural? This rural doesn't belong in Navi Mumbai. It can be anyone around you. There are still people who cannot afford to the high standards we are proposing to the you know, the one side spectrum. So then balance between the available resources, we should still have a rich resource, low resource settings or client needs and customize their antenatal care. The saga or the spectrum continues. Look at the agony. This we should not aim at. This is just like a mishap, but still we have to take care of this girl. Now the other side, a 70 year old or a 78 year old also is there. A choice was available to her and the family. And this, a 17, I'm just, you know, saying about this, uh, it is like a single umbrella. Can we deliver all these people? We are targeting at the aneuploidy and giving a choice to avoid such births in future. But parallelly, there is a support group which has to be there and they are looking forward in much different angles. 
and we are targeting the malformed fetae, the congenital anomalies, and trying to avoid such babies being born. But in this generation, the ones who have already been born are and who have undergone the palliative heart surgeries, and we are delivering them. We are giving them new hopes. They are planning pregnancy, and they are we are delivering them. So this is not anywhere far. This is happening in Navi Mumbai also. Anything after a transplant is like a new life, a reborn thing. So people after renal transplant, after liver transplant. Now this pandemic has brought us a new lot of patients where the critically ill or the bad lung people. So the antenatal care spectrum is all about you know handling all these people. And that brings me to the next point. Pandemic has brought a different concept of telemedicine consultation also to this antenatal care. But there was this WhatsApp, a near decade old WhatsApp used by many of us pampering the patients. Or is it trying to cover the so-called admit needs of antenatal care? But this keeps popping up in your screen. And this may be the situation like somebody who is sitting in one corner of India and taking a teleconsultation with you again in this antenatal care. So coming back to the basics, it's about preconceptional care, if possible, risk assessment, antenatal visits back to the evaluation, investigations, giving immunization and the supplements and the high-risk pregnancy to be identified, at-risk mother, at-risk fetus and added care and birth preparedness. It's about targeting a positive experience, informed decision-making, we have to give better realistic ideas here. Maybe we don't come across physical violence quite often as the one happened in Assam or you know, here, but the defensive practice we all do in this era is to counter the mental violence when the couple points fingers at whenever they face a bad outcome, even if it is a subtle one. So the point is don't forget to document the communication of information and decision making. I better borrow the medical legal experts dialogue, communicate, document, communicate the documentation, document the communication, yes. So the importance of antenatal care, the conventional or the traditionally known perinatal morbidity, mortality, as well as the maternal morbidity, mortality reduction. Along with that, the, the pediatric team has proposed this thousand days window of which the nine months is included in this thousand months. They say that this is there very much important for the long-term growth and development of the child. It is about identifying the genetic disorders, including the traits like thalassemia, following them up or any genetic disorder, which we can you know, dis, uh, predict and giving them the... and giving them a choice to intervene. And this antenatal care time is again a point of contact to identify many medical disorders, to identify the infectious diseases, genital infections, to screen for genital malignancy and hence their prevention. It may be an opportunity to initiate the adult immunization and, and further follow up. As a continuum of this antenatal care, the breastfeeding part, the infant care, contraception, birth spacing, and replacing the iron reserve of this woman and a better bone mass all can be highlighted. Also, this is to predict the long-term medical disorders, as in a woman with GDM, a woman with preeclampsia, all these people are prone for developing hypertension, diabetes in their adult livelihood and a great potential for intergenerational prevention of several chronic diseases like an IUGR baby, a, a, a obese or a macrosomic baby, they also have a potential to have adult onset diseases. It's a nine month window to identify intimate partner violence, a big opportunity to assess the mental health assessment, 
and it is about empowering this woman a different you know like this person is coming to you almost in nine months time we can empower this woman so in short this is about bringing a reproductive justice to this woman who may be entangled or crippled of multiple barriers so i conclude my talk here thank you i thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to thank you once again thank you ma'am thank you for the very informative talk and for uh, where we have reached and where we are heading to and for the concept of uh, reproductive justice uh, Mox is streaming all their uh, webinars on YouTube. Kindly visit our YouTube channel and subscribe and share. Now, moving on to our second talk today, we have Dr. Anuj Madam. Madam has been the past president for Nmox and would be delivering a talk on good clinical recommendations for antenatal care. Over to Anuj Ma'am. I'm not able to share the. Ma'am, I've stopped sharing. You're not. is it seen now yes but i can't see my presentation on my screen purva can you share from your side i'm not able to share from my side पूर्व और पर कैन यू शेयर मैडम प्रेजेंटेशन सो देर Yeah, it's there. We can see now. Okay. yeah thank you santosh thank you purva uh, so we begin the day with uh, basics in the obstetric care and i really congratulate rahul and his team to have chosen this basic uh, topic anuja has done an extremely wonderful job in laying the groundwork and i'm sure you all will find there are a lot of um, uh, overlap between uh, this talk and the previous talk but then we are now in that age where we learn by repetitions and repetitions 
so i'm going to talk on good clinical practice recommendations and these are formulated by taking into account the american college recommendations the canadian college rcog and australian guidelines what was the need for it the aim was to establish a basic minimum care which is required for a normal healthy woman my presentation has disappeared hello we can see it ma'am i can't see it from my end okay थैंक यू या प्रज्ञा इज शेयरिंग सो यू कैन आस्क टू Okay, so I will not be able to control from my side. Pradna, no. Pradna will uh, change the slide, ma'am, as uh, you want it. You will not okay, be able. Okay, fine. To... Okay, fine, fine, mm -hmm. fine. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So coming back to what the aims of these recommendations are, we wanted to give a basic minimum care which is required by a normal, healthy pregnant lady who carries a single term pregnancy. and of course taking into account the paucity of resources which are available in our country's rural settings so keep this in mind and it does not cover the additional care that women who are expected to develop complications in future in pregnancy they are needed can you switch over the slide next now two words of caution over here these recommendations are merely guidelines sort of margadarshan for good clinical practice and they are not legally binding on all clinicians also they don't override the individual responsibility of the healthcare provider to make decisions appropriate to the circumstances of the individual patient next slide so now before we begin let us divide what information we want to give or what service we want to give into two packages so one is the basic package which is recommended for all pregnant women and the other is the additional or add on package which can be offered if it is available in their resource settings next so what is the basic care packet now just imagine you are practicing in a very remote area in the rural setting so what basic care you can give to your patient regular antenatal visits at least one in first trimester then monthly visits till 30 weeks then biweekly um sorry fortnightly till 36 weeks and weekly till the patient delivers minimum investigations of hemoglobin blood group vdrl random blood sugar and urine routine preferably a urine routine and uh, hemoglobin urine sugar and hemoglobin to be done in the third trimester minimum two doses of tetanus either tetanus toxoid or tetanus diphtheria if available iron folic supplementation with calcium to all patients at least one ultrasound for ruling out congenital anomalies preferably before 20 weeks of pregnancy delivery to be conducted by a doctor or a trained birth attendant minimum education on nutrition diet hygiene education in breastfeeding how to manage the baby and the breast after the breastfeeding birth spacing and contraception methods next slide now come back to the place where you are practicing the tier 2 and tier 3 cities where we have an add on package it includes pre conception counseling and care counseling for hiv hepatitis b hcv testing counseling and screening for thalassemia and down syndrome repeat hemoglobin blood sugar urine evaluation in each of the trimesters ultrasound evaluation in each of the trimesters institutional delivery to be recommended additional screening for infections growth retardation thyroid dysfunction so on and so forth next slide next slide
Yeah. So at the beginning, only we said that these uh, basic uh, guidelines are for a low risk patient who is carrying a singleton pregnancy and who is not expected to have either fetal or maternal complications later on in the pregnancy. So that besides that woman, all other women fit into this category, like extremes of BMI, extremes of ages, those who are having medical disorders like anemia, cardiac disease, hypertension, renal, thyroid, diabetes, epilepsy, which the patient is taking treatment for, asthma and other respiratory disorders, hematological disorders, suffering from HIV or hepatitis B, drug abuse, go back, psychiatric, malignant, and not forgetting multiple pregnancy. And those, next slide, those patients who are having history of previous recurrent pregnancy losses, preterm birth, severe preeclampsia, HELP syndrome, eclampsia, and the previous pregnancies, RH isoimmunization, those who have had uterine surgeries, including previous cesareans, myomectomies, or cone biopsies, history of APH or PPH, history of previous MRP, puerperal psychosis, grand multi, history of stillbirth, neonatal death, and a baby with a congenital anomaly. So all these patients who are fitting into this category will require additional care. Next slide. As the previous speaker has stressed upon the care being women-centered, this has to be driven in today. The care has to be women-centered and enough information has to be given to the woman so that she can take an informed decision. Next slide. The information which we give has to be preferably written or pictorial, preferably in the local language. Now recap all those uh, ladies who used to come to us on the SMA clinics at the various PHCs when we used to go on 9th of each month, they used to carry a small booklet. Pictorially, everything was uh, marked in that. So that type of pictorial information has to be given to these patients, which describes the diet, the prevention of anemia, importance of regular antenatal checkups. And these patients, to give them more information, they can be taken around the facility if we have that uh, uh, available with our setups. And they can be taken to the labor room to show them the delivery, the postnatal wards, to show how breastfeeding mothers are so that they can interact with the breastfeeding mothers. Next slide. There has to be a proper organization of care. So first thing which comes in mind is who is going to deliver these patients? Yes, the a &M, the trained uh, the provider or the doctor if uncomplicated or low risk pregnancy and obstetrician if it is a high risk or a complicated pregnancy. Continuity of care is extremely important because over a period of time, these patients do develop a sort of rapport with the clinician and they would like to be seen by the same clinician every time they come. There has to be a clear referral pathway marked. You all will recall that there were set indications when to refer a patient to a, uh, a high risk OPD. So the path should be very clear. Documentation uh, uh, has to be uniformly structured so that there is no confusion. And then this will also ensure that our checklists are formally filled. We do not miss on anything. Women with special needs who do not understand the language or who are deaf and mute or who are illiterate, they need special uh, care. Uh, certain written forms or pictorially signaled forms are there with different signages. And of course, they can take the service of an interpreter who can be their own family member. There has to be a standardized national maternity record. This we have seen with our SMA clinics. All the uh, records were same at all the same UHCs. So everybody... Uh, put in the information in the required column and nothing was missed out. Next slide. 
certain lifestyle considerations have to be uh, discussed. Some of them are asked by the patient herself. Some are given by information is given by the clinician. Like work during pregnancy. By working during pregnancy, we mean working outside the house during pregnancy. Nutritional supplements, prescription medicines, exercise, sexual intercourse, alcohol smoking, travel and pregnancy. These are some of the topics which either come up in due course of examination during the antenatal visits, or we have to give this information time to time. Next slide. Usually uh, working out during pregnancy is considered harmless uh, if there are no medical or no fetal uh, in the contraindications to that. Light work is recommended throughout the pregnancy, but there have been certain studies which have shown that if a lady is working prolonged standing in the last trimester, these babies weighed around 150 to 400 gram, lesser than the newborns of mothers who were not working in prolonged standing. And the reason they thought that they said was that there were placental infarcts seen in the placenta of these ladies and which was the reason for this low birth weight. On the other hand, the, there are studies which show that there is no relationship between the uh, length of gestation or the height and weight and, uh, of the baby, which, is, which can be attributed to maternal work. Next slide. Nutritional supplements, we all agree that iron folic, calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, zinc, omega-3 fatty acids do play a role because sometimes our diets are lacking and sometimes there are absorption problems. Next. Prescription medicines, time and again, the patient can come with some complaints which are uh, going to need uh, the pharmacological uh, treatment. The only thing is that we have to keep the risk and benefit ratio of the drug in mind and prescribe the medicine. Next, exercise, extremely important. If the patient is continuing with an exercise program, she can continue the same through in, uh, her pregnancy if there are no obstetric uh, or medical uh, contraindications to that. The benefits are that it improves posture, it decreases backache and fatigue. It can also prevent GDM to some extent. It leaves stress and prepares for better labor and delivery. Next. Sex during pregnancy, usually uh, a very indirect pointer asked by the patient. Um, again, if there are no obstetric indication, contraindications, sex during pregnancy is quite safe after the first trimester and to be avoided in the last month. And the potential complications um, like preterm labor, pelvic inflammatory diseases, antepartum hemorrhage, venous air embolism, there are very less evidence in literature that these are caused by sexual intercourse. Next slide. Alcohol and smoking are definite no-no if the patient is already uh, conceived and she was smoking and having alcohol, she is asked to immediately stop because there is a good amount of evidence which shows that it can cause sudden infant death syndrome, the small for gestational age babies, FGRs and fetal alcohol syndrome, every one of us is aware about. Next slide. Travel during pregnancy, we come across this question quite often because we have this culture of first timers going to the mother's place to deliver. Travel again is safe after first trimester till 36 weeks. That is the long distance travel. Whenever you want to travel, the patient has to have a clinical checkup done by the clinician. And when the travel is by air and it's a long flight, precautions for DVT has to be informed to the patient. Next slide. Diet and hygiene during pregnancy, again, it is uh, the information need to be given in the pictorial form, preferably a balanced diet after the first trimester, keeping in mind the BMI considerations of the patient, primary infection prevention, prevention measures such as washing of hands before handling foods, thoroughly washing all fruits and vegetables, thoroughly cooking raw meats and fish, and wearing and uh, using gloves uh, when you are handling soil and farming. Next slide. 
these are the common symptoms which usually patients come across in their subsequent visits, nausea, vomiting, heartburn, constipation, hemorrhoids, varicose veins, discharge, and backache. Next slide. Usually, all these uh, uh, symptoms can be managed with a little bit of diet alterations, increasing the high fiber content, increasing liquid intake, exercising, some medications, home remedies. But if not, then specifically it has to be investigated and treated as per the cause. Next slide. Nausea vomiting uh, deserves a special mention because it has to be differentiated from hyperemesis gravidarum. And again, dietary modification, fortification with vitamin B6, medical or drug management. And if nothing works out, then IV alimentation is uh, advised. Next slide. Discharge is a very common complaint. We all come across we have to differentiate whether it's a normal discharge or an abnormal discharge. And if it is an infective discharge, prompt treatment of the patient and the partner because it can lead to preterm labor later on. And whether it is a bacterial vaginosis, that also we have to investigate and treat. Next. Now coming to clinical examination, this is extremely important and uh, it will... Uh, it sort of classify the patient into a high risk or a low risk. So height, weight, BMI at the very first visit. These days we are taking pulse respiration SpO2, especially with COVID. BP is a single most important part of the examination. I would like to say that each and every clinician should take BP themselves. Don't depend on anybody else's readings. BP has to be taken in a sitting position appropriate cuff size, 80% of the arm covered, cuff placed on the skin, not on the clothes, fourth corot cough sound for diastolic blood pressure, minimum two to three readings should be taken and a mean taken out of that. Both arm BP readings have to be taken. And if you are using digital instrument, it has to be properly calibrated. This is one extremely important uh, examination which the clinician should be doing herself. Next slide. Per abdomen, if you go back to the low resource setting, uh, if we do palpation or if we do symphysiofundal height to see the, whether the baby is growing appropriately or not, if you are doing symphysiofundal height, don't forget to plot it because this flattening curve can be an early indicator of whether the baby is uh, going in for a growth restriction. It can be of some help in the low resource setting uh, in diagnosing hydramnios or multiple pregnancies. And uh, after per abdomen, don't forget to do the systemic examination of the heart and lungs. That's extremely important. I've seen many of the times it is missed. And later on, when the patient presents with the uh, problem, then only it is diagnosed. Edema is, of course, uh, to be seen. Sometimes the patient her tell, herself tells us. Pelvic examination, usually not um, adequate or appropriate for dating the pregnancy or for predicting preterm labor or CPD, but it may have some value in the low resource settings. So while you're doing all these examinations, try to look for signs and symptoms of Domestic violence. Next slide. Domestic violence is more prevalent than it is evident and then it, we expect and what we are taken to expect. And it is important to uh, talk to the patient regarding uh, the type of violence because more maternal and perinatal complications are seen in such patients. There are more neonatal admissions there are more preterm births in such ladies, lactation difficulties, and postpartum psychosis. Next. Now, coming to investigations, the ANC profile, it has to be advised right at the first visit. CBC, blood group, and if negative, the partner's group. 
random sugar a1c some people do fasting blood sugar a1c is advised to see whether the patient is walking in the pregnancy with high blood sugars that is she's pre diabetic or not tsh hiv australia antigen hcv vdrl urine routine microscopic is one single examination which always comes most of the times faulty we have to see whether the uh, test is um, um uh, contaminated specimen or it is actually an infection uh, i am getting some disturbance hello urva you need to hear ha it's it's better now yeah. okay so when we see a urine routine uh, report showing uh, 80 to 20 pus cells and 25 to 30 um, again the disturbance of this purva and pradnya both of you have to mute yourself yeah. yes ma'am okay you can go ahead. yeah so coming back to the urine routine uh, the first thing we have to see is whether it is a really infective report or it is a contaminated report you ask the patient with uh, um, uh, a report showing 20 pus cells is she having any problem in passing urine if she says she does not she is comfortable then that means this is a contaminated report the second thing which will tell you is whether it is urine infection or not is the level of nitrites so go and see whether the nitrites are present or not if the nitrites are present and there are a lot of pus cells epithelial cells this is a infective report then this patient needs treatment and also a culture if not then this is a contaminated specimen ask the patient to take a real clean catch midstream urine and bring the report again the next investigation is the hemoglobin electrophoresis to see whether patient is having a beta thalassemia trait or not anti hbs antibodies antibodies to hepatitis surface antigen even if the patient has taken uh, vaccination for uh, hepatitis sometimes the level of antibodies in the body is less so if it is less than 10 she will need a re vaccination full course ict as depending on patient's group and uh, the husband's group can be done pap smear is advised at some centers and if you have the facility you can next coming to the screening test we all uh, in navi mumbai are familiar with and we are doing combined screening to rule out down syndrome uh, it is done at 11 to 13 weeks with an nt scan the age of the mother nt beta hct pap a are taken and the um, uh, risk for uh, trisomy 21 13 and 18 is given in the same situation same sitting if we take plgf and uterine artery pi we can give a risk analysis for preeclampsia and fetal growth restriction as well if this combined screen is missed in the first trimester patient can be offered a quad test in the second trimester but remember pre test counseling is an extremely important part patient should be very clear about why we are doing the test and if it comes positive there should be clear cut directed pathways of the further diagnostic test where the patient has to be sent what tests are to be recommended because uh, the sending clinician and the uh, geneticist has to be on the same page whether it is amnio or cvs or nipt we all have to be on the same page speaking the same language next slide screening for gestational diabetes yes we all are doing this uh, usually in our setups we are doing the 75 grams gct at around 24 weeks and if the levels are above 140 she is labeled as gdm between 120 to 140 is glucose intolerance less than 120 is normal and she is counseled and treated accordingly next slide rh isoimmunization yes if the patient is negative husband is positive ict is advised in the first trimester then in the neck uh, uh, at the and the 28 weeks if she comes negative ntd is advised 300 micrograms 
Finally, the baby's blood group at delivery and if positive, repeat dose of 300. Next slide. How many scans to be done in pregnancy? People are doing one scan every month, but that again is not the right way to go. The minimum number of scans for a um, smooth going of pregnancy are four. The first is the dating scan, which will, can be clubbed with the NT scan in the first trimester, the anomaly scan at 18 to 20 weeks, growth scan if the facility is available at 32 weeks, because it is at this gestation, we can see the growth curves flattening in cases of a late onset IUGR. And then the last is a very composite scan for growth of the baby, for the uh, Liker MEI, for the uh, Dopplers, uh, the blood flows. And this is advised at around 34 to 35 weeks. Next slide. Immunizations in pregnancy are uh, to be discussed. Uh, we give, as advised by the government of India, two tetanus vaccines, uh, the tetanus diphtheria combination and the tetanus diphtheria pertussis combination, if it is available. Four to six weeks gap has to be there in between the two. The flu vaccine can be given anytime after the first trimester. Antid, as we said, that uh, around 28 weeks and uh, the hep hepatitis B if the NTHBS antibodies are less than 10 and uh, full course has to be given after the first trimester is over. Next slide. Two things are very important. The first visit and the first trimester. So the first visit as Anuja also uh, insisted is extremely important and it is very time consuming. Lot of information has to be taken from the patient. Lot of information has to be given to the patient and lot of, uh, uh, there is uh, <clears throat> the history taking uh, of the patient forms the crux of this first visit. And in the history taking only, the risk strat stratification of the patient is done, whether she is a high risk patient or a low risk patient. Then the meticulous clinical examination is done to recognize the early signs and symptoms of any of the medical disorders or any of the pregnancy related complications which can come later on. Do's and don'ts have to be explained to the patient. Full ANC plan of management is discussed. Medications are prescribed and follow up visits. So this is an extremely, extremely important visit with lot of information processing done. Next slide. Now comes the first trimester. The first trimester is the most dynamic of all the nine months of the pregnancy. Traditionally, what we used to do, the uh, treatment interventions used to be started when the medical condition showed, when the signs and symptoms of a medical disorder became uh, visible. But now there is a paradigm shift Rather than waiting for the disorders to manifest, we are anticipating the disorder and trying to screen for them and start the institutions, the interventions at that particular level. Traditionally, we used to call the patient at 12 weeks, then at 16 weeks, then monthly till 30 weeks, then every 15 days till 36 weeks, then every week till the patient delivered. So the pyramid of care was base down and apex up. Now with Professor Nicolaides' work, this has been uh, flipped. The base is up and the apex has now come down. Why? Because in the first three months, there is lot and lot of information which is available and it has to be evaluated. We will begin with our traditional scan which we do at 11 to 13 weeks, the nuchal scan. Besides giving information uh, regarding the fetal aneuploidies, it can be used, as I said, for risk evaluation of preeclampsia and uh, FGR. First trimester, we can 
rule out whether the pregnancy is singleton or whether the pregnancy is multiple and if multiple what is the chorionicity of uh, the pregnancy whether it is a monochorionic or a dichorionic because we all know that monochorionic pregnancies have around 10 times more risk of complications as compared to dichorionics and if it is a monochorionic pregnancy if we see that one of the fetuses is having uh, high NT and the ductus uh, uh, flows are reversed, then this is the fetus which can be a candidate for TTCS later on. There is um, a screening for, there are, the algorithms are still being developed for screening for small for gestational age babies without preeclampsia. And here we, you, we use the placental protein 13 and ADAM12 as uh, the markers. And when we can say that we are, uh, we can predict growth restriction, the same way work is going on to see whether we can predict uh, macrosomic babies, whether we can predict gestational diabetes, all done with the maternal uh, history, maternal uh, demography, maternal um, uh, uh, blood markers. So work is still going on and uh, soon we will have these algorithms also. So in the end, like next slide, uh, this antenatal care, the basic care is to be provided to all and it can be customized depending on availability and affordability. Early recognizing of warning signs and high risk factors will lead to timely referral and start of suitable interventions and prevention of complications. And this will go a long way in reducing maternal and neonatal mortality and morbidity. Now, since we are going to have uh, uh, a full CME as Rahul told in the next few months to come on full uh, the first trimester, the note on the first trimester was just a bird's eye view. So with that, I thank all of you. And again, congratulate Rahul and Santosh and their team for doing such a wonderful job. Thanks a lot. Thank you, ma'am. That was a very wonderful, that was a wonderful, very elaborate, very crisp talk with great clarity. You would just take a moment here and uh, Navi Mumbai Obstetrics and Gynecology Society would like to thank NOPEX for their uh, support for this uh, CME. NOPEX is the makers of Folinop D, Folinop Plus, Magicad and Ferinop XG. Uh, thank you for your support. Um, moving on to the next speaker, we have Dr. Snehal Malakamir, ma'am. Uh, ma'am is a consultant, uh, is, a clinic, uh, is a clinical genesis at the Clinic of Genetic Medicine at uh, Navi Mumbai, Nehru. Uh, ma'am is also a consultant, a clinical genesis at Apollo Hospitals. Uh, ma'am is, uh, in the last few years, uh, is consulting patients in the genetic speciality from giving a wide range of uh, expertise in the premarital, preconceptional, prenatal, pediatric, in the adult medicine and in the cancer genesis too. Ma'am has been an invited speaker in number of topics related to clinical uh, genetics uh, and number of national and international conferences and has a lot of publications to her name. So Dr. Snehal Malakami on history taking, which uh, being the best tool for genetic screening. Dr. Snehal Malakami, ma'am, over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So shall I, shall I start screen share you? Let me know if it is, you know. So is it visible? Is it visible? Uh, yes, it's loading. We can A complete view? Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Hello and good morning all. Uh, when I uh, got this topic, you know, history taking for from NMRGS, initial thought was genetics is quite a futuristic medicine and why I'm being taken to history taking. But then uh, 
it, it's a wonderful topic when we when we go through it. When I was I started preparing, because historical insights always give us uh, provides clues, give us risks, and it is the only thing which uh, you know helps us in present and future management. So when we uh, while going through history of obstetrics, uh, when we see pictorial or artistic um, uh, uh, art uh, depicting uh, primary obstetric care, then you know pictures from Western medicine, uh, what what uh, how it is how it started. Then you have instruments, and then you have sophisticated medicine, sophisticated obstetrics giving 3D, 4D ultrasonic care. Uh, then uh, very good uh, operative care. And now we are moving on to a prenatal detection uh, into the womb of high-risk disorders. And now again, NIPT, which we, we need, just need maternal blood. And it also took me to my history of second year when we started history taking and learned from that the obstetrics. So I just shared a few screenshots where we started it off. That history taking from Datta when we used to, you know, uh, when we were we, we were just uh, started off in obstetrics, then how to calculate EDD from LMP, how to calculate what is G, what is P, A, D, and, and, and uh, what not, and abortions, and then duration of marriage, and what is the importance of religion and occupation, how to take the diet chart and nutritional history. So when we, it, it may be a past, but when we really sit into the clinic, uh, it has, it it is emphasized since our education till our clinical care that history taking uh, eases, eases you of whole of the part of our medicine when we you know sit in the clinic. Half of the work is done if it is a good history taking. And it's not that uh, it is only said, but it has also been evaluated from time to time. Since you know 1975, if you see this paper of uh, from British Medical Journal, uh, people are. Uh, calculating uh, how, you know, what is the contribution of history taking in pan physical examination and laboratory investigations in the management of medical outpatients or inpatients. So it has, it has also been uh, very uh, categorically evaluated. And now also, this is a recent publication 2017 in medical education journals, that how can we enhance student empathetic engagement by history taking by asking them to develop communication skills when we are actually in electronic medical record use. So even if we have moved on to electronic medical records, very much of digital uh, use into our clinical practice, how does it make a difference of a thorough history taking and enhancing, it helps us in enhancing communication skills. And of course, not to miss details when we are being poured into so much of information, whether we are really missing into something uh, when we, uh, if, if we don't uh, go into the details. So the traditional method of thorough history taking and physical examination, and then thinking about what investigations we are going to advise are needed. Uh, and it may take somewhat longer, but it remains, still remains a cornerstone of clinical practice. And more and more, more and more, we go into details of investigations, very you know, nitty gritties of, and very, very molecular uh, uh, investigations. Still every time, we come across difficult situation, the clinical uh, clinical uh, acumen trumps. And with the increasing use of electronic medical records, computer-based history taking in diagnostics and therapeutics, when we in a busy, busy OPD, we just fill it up and uh, move on. Uh, it also uh, emphasizes on phys physician's empathetic engagement, which it, it, it's adjusts to inherent physician and patient communication challenges, especially this, this digitally adapted empathy. So uh, we have been taught this in history taking that you have to, you know, you have to take current pregnancy details for second and third trimester, past obstetric history, past gynecological history, past medical and surgical history, drug history and allergies, family history, social history and personal history, history of systematic review investigations. When I started doing, you know, elaborating and making a slide, then I really realized that these are the points everyone should cover in history taking and before even going to clinical examination, forget about investigation. So there are so many points in the history still that we have to, you know, go into details. And nowadays, because we have, we are seeing so many of, uh, so much of in-depth 
uh, investigations also pointing, uh, you know, a lot of evidence-based medicine giving us insights into clinical details. People and many institutes are coming up with not only general obstetric questionnaire, but prenatal genetic screening questionnaire, where a student or an attending nurse or a physician or a junior or senior physician, they are supposed to fill out these questionnaires when at the first visit, so that not to miss smaller details. Even if we are bombarded with information, sometimes we tend to. So that is why they have made up these questionnaires, which are uniform, which can be electronically stored and which can be used into many further visits. And also it can be evaluated whether we are, you know, go back and analyze our data, whether we are really uh, going in, a, uh, in a, a proper methodical manner. So if we can see here name, uh, date of birth, uh, for age of the patient, family and patient history. Uh, so, somebody, somebody has to mute, somebody has to mute. You can start. Can you please continue? Dr. Snehal, ma'am. I think you have muted Snail ma'am. You have to unmute. Someone, please, uh, please unmute Snail, please. Yeah, now? Yeah. Yeah, now? Yes, ma'am. You can hear me. Yeah. So, where were we? Yeah, so this questionnaire. So, now the questionnaire also demands details from patients like what was the diagnosis because now patients know that my child had Gaucher disease, my previous child had this mutation detected, my child had this syndrome because they know about it. So even that much of details from history are being involved into this questionnaire and history taking. So initial part of uh, history taking involves ethnicity because we know in even in India, we have certain communities where thalassemia carrier status is high, certain communities where muscular dystrophies are common and HBE is common. So ethnicity uh, helps their community because if there are very closely uh, marine communities, uh, not very mixing up, then you expect them to have a very high uh, rate of genetic mutations and alleles which are abnormal and which may be passed on to next generation. So we have common mutation testing, sometimes they do it and then they come to us. So there are, there are available common mutation testing in such communities and of course consanguinity. So consanguinity to make it very simple, we have the squares are males and circles are females. I'm audible, right? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Yes, Auntie. Yeah, squares are males and circles are females. And the point, the arrow is the person who is visiting, the person who is giving us history or has come for examination. So if that is a lady which we which has which has come to us, then one step down that is child, one step side that is brothers and sisters, and one step up that is mother is first degree first degree relative. Two step downs, that is grandsons, two steps ups, that is grandfather, mother or uncles are second degree consanguinity. And then first cousins, that is one, you go by step by step, one, two, and then down, that is first cousin, that is third degree. So that is how we calculate second degree consanguinity marriage, third degree consanguinity marriage and up uh, and further to this is four degree consanguinous marriage. So it is very easy when, once we draw this diagram or once we at least, you know, uh, imagine uh, in the, how whether it is third degree or second degree. Second degree in India, we, we can call in South India, there are some Mama Bhanji marriages where it is directly on one side, it is, it, it may see, you may, it may look as third steps, but on the other side, because it is uncle, maternal uncle, it is just two steps. So that is, we call it as second degree consanguinity. So this figure, it, it's very easy to say uh, which is the third degree consanguinity, which is fourth degree. And farther we go, that fourth degree, fifth degree the genetic tree sharing decreases that is why uh, mutated allele sharing decreases and that is why risk decreases so we even if it is fourth and fifth or whatever you know in uh, blood relations uh, the chance of having a uh, an abnormal gene sharing decreases 
So let us see from one by one each point from that history, like you know, in past obstetric history. So if this is uh, diamonds are uncertain sex uh, in that particular pregnancy. So if this is a 32 year old female with G3P2 and uh, no live born baby with eight weeks of gestation, she's come to us. First child has died male of muscular dystrophy. Second has died of muscular dystrophy query. Query because there are no reports available. And males, you know, they are taken as DMD. But DMD is a viable pregnancy. Many of the Duchenne muscular dystrophy, they are born. So now here the comes here we have so many questions when we take when we come across such history that what could be the special specific clinical diagnosis whether there is any sex predilection because here only two males have died what should we tell patient whether the karyotype is needed in uh, prenatal screening uh, prenatal testing any sample is stored of previous pregnancies any obstetric high risk or precious and, and being a precious pregnancies what should we do so these are all points. Uh, history gives to us which all questions which the history proposes into our mind which we have to answer to ourselves and then guide patient so first is whether special specific clinical diagnosis was available in previous pregnancies which was not available and we cannot take for granted that males and there is uh, sex predilection because it was males because there was no specific clinical diagnosis because still in spite of having genetic diagnosis so many queries come to us that because there were males madam whether they this time, if it would be male, whether it would be affected in spite of prenatal diagnosis or screening, then we have to tell them that it, we have to take the history of what disease it was, whether in spite of whether it was any sex predilection in that particular disease and whether it would affect sex of the fetus and the prognosis or risk calculation in this current pregnancy. Any sample stored from previous pregnancies, because nowadays we send POCs, we may have DNAs or tissues stored. And that is why that history also gives us more clues whether we can investigate in current pregnancy because it's still eight weeks and we have a lot of time to investigate on the stores. Whether karyotype is needed, a child which whether if there are notes which are specifically mentioned by a pediatrician or a pediatric neurologist or any specialist mentioning that it was polyhydramnios, it was muscular dystrophy, then definitely only karyotype will not be sufficient. It may be a part of prenatal investigations because we also uh, we are taking the sample and it would be good to uh, screen for aneuploidies, but that is not uh, the needed for specific diagnosis. Maybe it is a part of investigations because if we are taking the samples for molecular investigations we are additionally taking karyotype to rule out aneuploidies so uh, karyotype and further investigations are needed in this case and whether there is any obstetric high risk because you know if there was a polyhydramnia so whether this polyhydramnia was really because of a child with congenital muscular dystrophy inside which was not moving and then had you know a, a, a muscular problems and they had polyhydramnia so whether there was other obstetric high risk which were giving polyhydramnia and an impression that the baby was not moving so how uh, uh, so my so many are such uh, just a pedigree or just a few points of from history uh, poses so many questions which we have to be carefully uh, answering to patients. Then one more example from past obstetric history, uh, mother uh, arrow pointing to mother, usually we draw three degree, three generation pedigree. So we go up to three degree relatives. So if this is a mother pointed by point, uh, arrow, um, arrow pointing to the person who is consulting is called as proband. So even if we see affected child and if the mother is consulting, we point it by arrow as a proband. It's called as proband because you will hear this word in the genetic report that proband was tested. Proband was, you know, had this mutation. So that is why I'm telling you this. Mother is 27 years old with 12 weeks, three days gestation. If that is only history, say first line, that mother is 27 years old and 12 weeks, three days gestation with what one abortion first trimester, triangles are abortions uh, or uh, terminations and uh, three years old female child and now is the third pregnancy. So of course this is a precious pregnancy and we we should be careful because it was first trimester abortion whether it was any uh, apart from your if your obstetric history is clear and no high risk whether there was any there were any chromosomal or other genetic factors which were contributing to that first abortion if other genetic other obstetric or medical reports are normal. And if I add to that history of the patient telling me that NT or my NT was very high and even in my first pregnancy or first abortion, my NT was very high, then you start going on to, you know, risk of Turner syndrome, risk of Down syndrome. And here comes, as Madam has said, 
that what test we have to go for, what test we need to counsel, what test we should know about limitations of interpretation, whether we should tell this patient we could just 12 weeks, whether we should tell NIPS, CVS, if an NT was how it would be, uh, you know, the scenario if NT just borderline increased, whether we should do triple quadruple markers, whether we should directly advise termination because NT is so high, it's almost 6 mm sometimes, you know, a radiologist tells you that this is a hydrosphetalis, why to go for such, uh, in, uh, such a, a, a expensive testing. So there are so many questions which every case to case basis, they are, uh, they are different ones, dif uh, you know, different answers to it. So in this case, 12 weeks mother, 27 years old, had it been a, more than 30, 35 years, of course, there is a high risk. So T1, T21 is risk would be very high in this case, say with NT added. Uh, in that case, uh, the counseling or the explanation would be a little different. Then we have, if, if we can offer NIPS. Now, in a, in a case where you are seeing on a USG, very frank hydrox, very high NT, where you really, you know, you are sure you're, you're, you're more inclined towards termination, that if then uh, you have to think about whether you, have, you want to put in a needle for CVS, you want to put in a needle if pregnancy is little more for amniocentesis. Then you can obviously discuss NIPS with this patient for trisomy 13, 18, 21, monosomy X and triploidy. These are the five disorders which are usually screened. There are further five disorders because of, I think, pandemic, the samples are not going out, but Prader Willi and 1P, uh, one first chromosome, chromosome 5 and uh, 22 Q11, which are also being screened, but currently trisomy 13, 18, 21, tri monosomy X, that is Turner and triploidy. So these five disorders, whether NIPS, because the prices have are coming down, they are, they are, so many patients would want to take this test. And then, of course, after test, you have to tell them that NIPS is S, meaning still a screening test. Even if it is NIPT, it is a non-invasive prenatal screening test. It is a screening test. So if it comes high risk, you have to do CVS or amniocentesis, depending on the uh, weeks of gestation. So then the limitations of NIPS in this particular case, that if NIPS shows a low risk, it doesn't mean that there are no other abnormalities, genetic abnormalities. If NIPS is high risk for any of these five, then you have to go and confirm. In that case, you may not also, you know, after NIPS high risk, you still won't go for CVS amniocentesis. We are anyway going to terminate. You terminate, take the sample and do a karyotype rather than doing NIPS and CVS and then termination. So if, and then if uh, the, the, there's no option of NIPS, if the patient doesn't want to take it up, that NIPS and then CVS or et cetera, if there is any NT is borderline increased and you want to still conserve the pregnancy and see what happens in next scan, then you can advise CVS, take the sample, do the karyotype, preserve the DNA. If karyotype comes normal, and still you're getting a progressive hydrox. If your next scan anomaly maybe or earlier anomaly scan in such cases, if you want to do it, and if it still shows abnormalities and then you want to process that DNA, you don't have to again go and do amniocentesis. So you do CVS, you do a karyotype, no need to do fish in these cases or QFPCR because in very high risk cases, what are you going to achieve? You are still 12 weeks, karyotype comes after four weeks, so you have still time in hand. So no need to advise every and every patient fish and QFPCR and adding five, 6,000 to it. But of course, sometimes you may get culture failures in karyotypes. In those cases, you can talk to laboratory. They have that cultural cell, or cell button preserved because it is mandatory under if the laboratory is accredited as per accreditations and you can still perform fish on those cell buttons. So you have to keep in mind when you are dealing with a precious pregnancy or if, if you are anyway terminating how much you have to conserve on to samples or money or you know discussion so if a single case you have so many questions from uh, uh, from the couple and whether you want to advise triple or quadruple you know you have to wait uh, after nipas whether i should do triple quadruple and wait or whether we, i should do cvs so uh, as I, we have elaborated every situation you have to take a call depending on uh, the test you are ordering, the limitations of the test, and the intention of the parents after doing the test, whether they want to really go immediately for termination and then to the investigations and how, how it is. In this case, uh, this mother had a history of previous loss of pregnancy in maybe mid, mid trimester, but there was a history of itching in the mother and yellowish eyes during that pregnancy. 
Now, uh, in this current pregnancy, the, the pregnancy, this pregnancy was later investigated for liver function test, and uh, the liver function tests were quite high. The current pregnancy also she had significant teaching. Now, this happens in uh, progressive uh, familial uh, intrafamilial cholestasis disorders, where some of these uh, diseases need liver transplant. If they are earlier done, the baby is completely fine. And we had we have seen seen such cases, and because liver transplant is available, people are going for it. And I think in this case, mother couldn't donate because she had itching, and she was also a carrier of the same mutation, and that is why uh, auntie uh, donated uh, her liver. But this is how some obstetric history from past, whether there are history of itching or a mild jaundice, which can guide you in current pregnancy, whether this baby could have, has to be monitored or told to pediatrician to see for jaundice. They may not manifest jaundice. They may just manifest uh, jaundice later on, but only clay colored stools initially and baby is fine. And when the, as the baby grows, may manifest with liver disease. Also, some of the cases I have seen that mother is having thrombocytopenia and earlier child had died and mother was referred in this pregnancy, no sample stored and this pregnancy also had thrombocytopenia. But the previous child history suggested that it could be viscot allele syndrome where you have thrombocytopenia, you have immune disorders and the child had died. And mother was a carrier and she was uh, having a significant, you know, deleterious mutation which was giving thrombocytopenia in the last trimesters of this pregnancy also and then we evaluated that baby and also you know for whether it could have that mutation and turn out to be viscotologist syndrome and these syndromes are uh, they don't have mental retardation they would just have thrombocytopenia which can be managed so it's not that every you know syndrome is uh, having those uh, problems in this case we have um, yeah, so this is a this is a, this is a sister who had come who was doctor and the first first sister had uh, multiple abortions. I have don't, I think only shown three, but she had two three abortions earlier, and she was pregnant. And the second sister also wanted to plan pregnancy, and they were very scared because their uh, uh, brother had died. Yeah, early age in 20s because of some muscle problem. So as I've told you that many of the muscle problems are taken as decision muscle dystrophy. So even if even if, if there is no evidence, we have to take history. As for the history, uh, the um, uh, brother dying in 20s is taken as DMD. Now we have, we don't have brother, we don't have a sample. And in spite of it, just because it was taken as DMD, First sister was evaluated for carrier status. Every of her pregnancies was tested for dystrophin gene mutation. And still she had abortions and there was no clues. And that is why second sister was afraid of whether it will still happen to me. But then when we, going back, if we, it is a simple answer that you just test mother, you know, mother of these two sisters. And she was not carrier of uh, dystrophin gene mutation. We got a different mutation responsible for different muscular dystrophy. And that was autosomal recessive. So mother was carrier, father was carrier. Now, if mother was carrier, it is obvious that sister would be either carrier and because it is not X-linked, autosomal recessive disease, there is no threat to pregnancy as such for that muscle uh, disease. So it was so quite clear and I didn't test in this sister, but we were a little cautious where, where and, and there was no consanguinity. It was a very distant, you know, uh, to inter uh, past marriage. So it's, it's uh, uh, risk was very low as good as normal population. So um, pregnancy testing was awarded in this current, uh, in, in, in this sister. And the previous sister was again, uh, it, it was re-evaluated whether there were any obstetric causes, whether there were any other genetic causes. And in the current pregnancy, depending on the scans, she was offered if, if required any uh, general mutation testing or a specific gene testing, depending on the scans. And I think uh, it was done, This uh, that pregnancy also had IOGR, had to be terminated and then evaluated and got a different genetic mutation, which was evaluated in next pregnancy and she had a healthy baby. But we could avoid testing in the second sister. So that is how the obstetric history and the family history uh, guides us. Only one testing in the mother clarified all the questions. Now, in this case, couple presented with abnormal and ANC scan at 18 weeks. So there was spontaneous abortion at eight weeks. This is this was spontaneous conception, married since one year, no significant family history. First trimester screening was normal. 12 weeks gestational, uh, 11 to 13 weeks scan was normal. And 18 weeks, you show short long bones. So it is a typical case of skeletal dysplasia when you see short long bones. You may be having associated cardiac or other abnormalities. You may not have the abnormalities and fetal 2D echo was normal because 
earlier child we had the problems and abortions uh, even if everything was done so in cases it, it is just an uh, it, it just an a depiction which can be applied to many single genetic disorders that you see short long bone so it can be chromosomal it can be single gene disorder it can be a syndrome syndrome can be chromosomal can be single gene can be multiple gene so you have to see whether this syndrome is fitting into which type of genetic disorder and then you have to order the investigation some syndromes may not have any genetic test to do still they are still under research some syndromes may have multiple you know factors with genes multiple genes or environments so have to really think and then do the prenatal counseling or testing so in cases of skeletal dysplasia as you know that may be perinatally lethal or sometimes some are milder at birth sometimes they present later where you have a history of fathers having similar disease or anybody any any in the family having a short stature so you have to really see whether you have to do prenatal testing in cases where it is a mild disease or a long term disease you usually don't do prenatal testing if it is a severe disease it's severe disease enough to cause lethal uh, problems or a very grave uh, problems for life or very difficult to manage disorders which make the child disabled for life then we advise prenatal testing and then in case at at 18 weeks you can do amniocentesis you may have to do quick genetic sequencing for uh, significant uh, skeletal dysplasia genes if they want to continue the pregnancy after counseling then you can do karyotype plus gene sequencing or sometimes you know you have other markers sometimes is this child uh, in the next pregnancy maybe next pregnancy was also uh, also long bones presenting at 26 uh, weeks so here we have on sonography we could see narrow short ribs even a sonography you can see the face is like a um, mps you know this is a child with was the de after delivery we have taken pictures but even uhg was showing a face like this having severe thoracic thoracic dysplasia leader and then child was the pregnancy have was delivered and then investigated so that is how i told you that we have to time the investigations depending on whether patients or couple affords whether they want to do investigations whether they want to continue pregnancy or not then past gynecological history here is a history of infertility the child was born when the child was there when i saw it was in icu with uh, uh, severe acidosis and it turned out to be methyl malonic acidemia the child died later on but the there was a history of infertility and after investigations after uh, the getting the mutations of the child when i tried to test father and mother for the next pregnancy because there was history of infertility and then the, this child was born after maybe 10 years and then the laboratory tells me that madam the mutation is not present in uh, both the parents it's very difficult uh, to and uh, you know interpret autosomal recessive disease child has uh, severe disease and both mother and father were normal how it is possible and then they gave you know history father told me when mother was not there that the child was born of query ovum donation which was not told to i don't know whether it was told to uh, pay, uh, mother or whether whether she was aware or whether that iv facility had made that record and the documentation of available at that time but sometimes it makes a, a lot of difference when you uh, take history uh, you have to ask for if, if there is a history of infertility and how the parents conceived because it poses problems in genetic interpretation also in this case past medical and surgical history like this mother was having um, mother had a, a renal problem and then going back she started saying that yes i ha i'm having problem in walking and then she was tested and had some sensory motor neuropathy she had abnormal gait but otherwise she was normal then she her father had bilateral fetal edema her grandmother was bedridden so there were different different manifestations in the family but you can obviously see that this is autosomal dominant disease presenting in each generation so here the first child uh, it is an adult onset disease so uh, there is no uh, question that we have to test in uh, the pregnancy because adult onset diseases we don't test in prenatal uh, diagnosis we just counsel them uh, and uh, obviously you have to monitor this child for it's not only obstetric management but also this child has to be managed and referred uh, at which at which point of life you have to advise the child needs to be evaluated so just a pedigree drawing or just a history will give you whether this is autosomal dis dominant disease or recessive or extinct in this case you have uh, this uh, lady and the uh, her 
brother was affected with her brother was affected had an abnormal gait and sensory neuropathy and muscular dystrophy now the wife tells me when when i started because they wanted to know whether the they will have you know preconceptional counseling whether they would have affected pregnancy now here you have a sip ship we call this as sip ship sip ship that is though both the siblings are affected which happens usually in autosomal recessive disorder so in autosomal recessive disorder even if the wife is affected she would give one affect defective allele and unless the husband is affected there would be no risk for the child the child would always be a carrier so here uh, you can say and because it is any way adult onset late onset disease we would won't test so uh, automatically the fear is relieved that uh, 50% chance of normal 50% of chance be carrier very rarely if husband is having the uh, gene uh, which is as good as normal background population risk 1 to 4% then they would have affected pregnancy where they, they they have they have their own thinking of taking a chance of doing prenatal investigations or not and the wife later on tell, told that the symptoms were just last 3 to 4 years and brother they were a little earlier so this is how a medical and here uh, sometimes you get surgical history of gall bladder stones where we have some uh, or, or some metabolic diseases in in born errors of metabolism when you have uh, operated gall bladder stones in the mother or you you have we have we have been hearing uh, since our ug days that is a health syndrome in the mother which gives clues to in born errors of metabolism in the child so some of the past medical and surgical history points you and also is helps you to relieve apprehension in the couple whether there will be really threat to their pregnancy or not drug history and allergies madam has already told but epilepsy medications are have to be watched for because nowadays uh, many of uh, the specialties uh, have started doing pharmacogenomics that is uh, some genetic polymorphisms in uh, the patients who are receiving specific drugs in uh, western countries they have specific guidelines if you are prescribing this uh, a particular drug then you have to test mutations in the, those metabolizers some of them are poor metabolizers some of them are intermediate metabolizers so you have to particularly test that polymorphism and then adjust the dose of the medicine so it has also come to india in cancers and in some of the diseases where we have recommendations of pharmacogenetics uh, so the, uh, it's not i don't know uh, what, whether it's being followed for epilepsy but it will soon come then we have allergies uh, where the child the mother may have uh, very mild uh, allergies like you know polymorphic eruptions on the skin or just a neosinophilia but it can be a familiar hypoallergenic syndrome Uh, or familial eosinophilic granulomatosis where the child will present in repeated pneumonias repeated asthmatic attacks repeated aspergillosis now we are we are quite hearing aspergillosis mucormycosis and it was earlier also seen in asthmatic patients some of the patients who are cystic fibrosis carriers i'm not talking about patients the hyper uh, the uh, patients who are carriers of cystic fibrosis uh, gene variations they usually prone for this uh hyperreactive airway disease or asthmatic like presentations and they also have uh, repeated aspergillosis infections or mucormycosis seen in the respiratory tract so these are all histories which can give clues to test if the mother can have has some genetic disease social and personal uh, history apart from that yeah i'll, I'll finish it off. Uh, alcohol uh, yeah and alcohol and smoking and tobacco which we have gone through diet nutrition uh i'll skip this because thalassemia is quite common and we have been doing this down syndrome and history of systematic review i think i'm 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 just done so history of systematic review now this mother had a mild aortic stenosis and her sister had aortic stenosis and child came with mild speech delay now in some of the williams syndrome presentations where we have supravalvular aortic stenosis developmental delay and dysmorphic facies this is the family who had not a complete william syndrome but there is one gene elan gene which is present in the same region of that chromosome but a single gene mutation which causes aortic stenosis and it is autosomal dominant and a very mild dysmorphic features there will be mild speech delay the child would be absolutely normal intelligence wise and would not have many manifestations and aortic stenosis also can be just monitored need not always have uh surgical implications just needs monitoring so this is how system history of systematic diseases review helps us and history of investigations which i have not included in today's talk because it's quite complicated to go through it case because uh, many patients now because they've already done microarrays they've already done fish 
there is inconclusive diagnosis in the affective choice, child uncertain significance, inconclusive diagnosis in POCs, termination of pregnancy in view of some finding in the genetic report positive, and still there is no clue. Or reports are normal in presence of very subtle abnormalities on UAGs or a child or a query autism and whether there is death, query liver disease and death. So there is, the history of investigations is very important when we have to take certain decision or certain counsel in the pregnancy so that it guides us which uh, testing we have to do or which counseling we have to do in the current pregnancy. And this is a new area coming up for gestational diabetes, for nutrigenetics and epigenetics, which will help us uh, in uh, deciding uh, the course of IUGR babies, gestational diabetes in premature babies. So there is a lot of work going in the areas of epigenetics, gestational diabetes and eclampsia, where we have to find out the genetic high risk alleles, which will tell us the course in the pregnancy or prematurity in IUGR. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Take care and stay healthy during current times. Thank you, NMOJS. Thank you, Dr. Santosh Rahul and Dr. Manisha and for your patient here. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the very good so there are few uh, uh, Dr. Snehan ma'am we have a request for you in the chat box if you could please for history taking sheet I didn't get you I didn't get you uh, for you I was in the not chat able to hear. box asking if you can share your history taking sheets for pre uh, pre no? your voice is interrupting but i think you asked me to share history taking what format yes ma'am history taking format uh, so that we can have a detailed genetic history so if you have any format or sheet uh, regarding that if you it would be good if you share it with us yeah, so I'll, I'll make up one and I'll email you an image so that it can be shared on your platforms. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah. Pradnya? I'm so sorry, ma'am. Thank you again, ma'am, for the very talk, very informative talk. Uh, next one. For the for Nanology Society, I'm will be categorization and strategies and everything. Yes, uh, thank you, Pradnya. And now, can you please stop uh, screen sharing so that I share my screen? Pradnya, thank you so much for inviting me. Can you please stop sharing your screen so that now I will share my screen? Yes, Good morning. Good morning, Navi Mumbai Society. Yeah, I think now I'm uh, audible, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so here we go. I'm so happy to participate in today's uh, CME and thanks to Dr. Rahul and Santosh for uh, giving me some time and putting my views about risk stratification of pregnancy. We all are basically obstetricians and seeing patients day in and out. Dr. Anuja and Dr. Anu has really, uh, you know, uh, I will not say foundation, but they have covered almost entire thing or the entire antenatal care that we provide to our patients and made my job quite easy. But what I'm going to do is just, you know, put things a uh, little bit in an organized manner and see how we can identify 
high-risk patients in our busy practices and provide proper care. What is actually high-risk pregnancy? High-risk pregnancy we all are dealing with, but in simple words, those pregnancies in which either adverse maternal outcome or adverse fetal outcome or perinatal outcome come, uh, is the possibility. I mean, there is a high possibility of adverse maternal outcome or adverse fetal outcome. We consider this pregnancy as high-risk pregnancy. And here I can give you a simile of a kundali, a janma kundali, in which they lay various factors in various squares and then predict or tell probability that particular education of the child, the marriage of the child, you know, and so many events in the life are, there is a possibility of complication or are hard, or there are certain hardships. So similarly, we are about to put a kundali of a fetus or rather of a pregnancy and see because of these various factors, is there a possibility of adverse maternal outcome or a adverse fetal outcome? We know that if a mother has many ailments or disorders right from the beginning of pregnancy or even pre-pregnancy, pregnancy is going to put additional burden and may worsen the disease. Whether the mother has a heart disease, be it a congenital heart or the rheumatic heart, which used to be very common earlier, or now with advanced maternal age, the coronary artery disease. If mother is on anticoagulants or anticonvulsants, if she has pre-existing restrictive or obstructive airway disease, she has a chronic renal kidney disease, she is hypothyroid, she is type 1 or type 2 diabetes, or she is suffering from essential hypertension, all these comorbidities, if mother already has in a pre-pregnant state, remember, pregnancy is going to put additional stress on this disorder, which probably are going to exacerbate during pregnancy and going to pose a risk factor for adverse maternal outcome. Certain pregnancy complications are very important for adverse maternal outcome and what is worst maternal or adverse maternal outcome is maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity and we all know that these are three main killers of uh, mother or three main important factors responsible for mortality preeclampsia pph and infection so those pregnancies which are likely to go for pph preeclampsia and infection i will say are actually a high risk pregnancy. So PPH, more possibility if multiple pregnancies, if uh, you are doing uh, on uh, augmentations, interventions, operative deliveries, so on and so forth. Infection and mortality because of infection is possible if mother has other prevalent factors like poor socioeconomic status, poor nutrition, anemia, hygiene, operative delivery. So all these, all in all, all these factors, when they come into picture, definitely that pregnancy is going to be a high-risk pregnancy. What about the baby? Baby is likely to develop complication and pregnancy, uh, certain pregnancies, some complications may happen and result in adverse perinatal outcome. So what, what is actually adverse perinatal outcome? In worst scenario, in and fetal death, stillbirth, fresh stillbirth, then severe FGR, then prematurity. So adverse perinatal outcome is related to either spontaneous or induced premature birth, IUGR, stillbirth, neonatal death, and in some cases, large babies or macrosomia as well. So, in our antenatal care surveillance, the antenatal care that we offer to patients, typically, if at all pre-pregnancy or post-marriage visit is there, well and good. If not, then first visit is confirmation of pregnancy every month till seventh month, every 15 days till ninth month, and every week till 40 weeks of pregnancy. So, in all, it is almost 14 years, 15 antenatal visits Three to five visits add to it just to show you reports. Few visits, incidental visits because of some of the other uh, elements or illnesses. So all these visits put a lot of stress, 
not only on the patient, but also on the healthcare system, including us. It is more costly and it defeats the purpose of early detection because with busy thing, you are likely to miss on something. But the entire um, focus on antenatal care surveillance is on early detection and initiation of treatment. And hence the need of risk stratification. So what do, you, what do we mean by risk stratification is probably less surveillance is needed for low risk mothers and close monitoring and close surveillance is needed for high risk mothers. Even if I'm saying mothers, it also means close monitoring for high risk babies. So our job is to see if we can predict certain complications in pregnancy so that some preventive strategies can be planned. If not, at least early detection is possible and we initiate treatment very early. Now, when to do this risk stratification? As Dr. Anu has very rightly said, first visit is very, very important and it is usually uh, in our urban scenario in first trimester, maybe at around six to eight weeks. So that first visit, but you are not going to stratify this, that visit you are making uh, use of to gather multiple data about the patient and to help to stratify it at 12 weeks. So ideally risk stratification should best be done at 12 weeks. By 20 weeks, the normal C of fetus that is structural and if at all any genetic abnormality in the fetus is there, it is established. So normal C of pregnancy that is the fetus is established by 20 weeks. So maybe at 20 weeks is the another time when again you re-stratify the risk. How we are going to do this? These are multiple factors and what tools we have in our hand. First is demographic data of a patient. Second is taking detailed history. Third, clinical examination. And last is labs and sonography. So with these four tools, we are going to strat uh, stratify our patients into high risk and low risk. Now looking into it one by one, what are important factors in age? Extremes of age, that is teenage pregnancy, early pregnancy, pregnancy less than say 18, 19 years uh, of age and the elderly population that is more than 35. Nowadays, we are getting pregnancies even at 40, 41, 45 years. I think each one of us is experiencing both these extremes in our ANCOPs. Now, younger the age, more possibility of anemia, preeclampsia, PPH, traumatic delivery, Advanced is the age, again, more possibility of comorb having comorbidities existing in that patient, traumatic delivery because body's flexibility, you know, and adaptability has changed with the age, possibility of thrombosis, possibility of preeclampsia. So all these are the risk factors. So extremes of age is one of the risk factor and you should say that she's a high risk patient. Pre-pregnancy factors, age. Then conception, if it's a spontaneous conception of, or if it's ovulation induction medicines have been used or if it's a ART pregnancy. Patient's immunization status, has she been immunized for MMR, chickenpox, flu, COVID in current scenario? If yes, well and good. If not, then there is always a possibility of a risk exposure. It means a mother is pregnant, she is never immunized for chickenpox, she has never had chickenpox, but her first child, if gets chickenpox, then this mother is exposed, not only the mother, but the baby, the risk of exposure to chickenpox and its complications during pregnancy. So this is just one example to quote. Nutritional status of the mother, if she is undernourished, nutritional anemia, so we have to assess this. If she is undernourished, there are chances of FGR, anemia-related complications. Metabolic disorders like PCOD, like type 2 diabetes, like dyslipidemia, obesity, again more complications, more chance of GDM, thrombosis in pregnancy and puerperium, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. How is her lifestyle? Smoking, these are important factors and we cannot neglect them because all of them carry certain risks like Low fruit intake, that is poor quality of diet, 
smoking, alcohol consumption, in our cases, even nicotine users, multiple partners, sexual partners and STIs have the risk of pre, uh, syphilis and HIV risk. And previous all lifestyle factors have a risk on preeclampsia and stillbirth possibility. Chronic illnesses like epilepsy, asthma, heart disease, autoimmune disorders, they put patient for risk because, because of the disorder per se and because of medications that are used for the controlling for controlling of the disorder. So these medications or medicines or polytherapy has effect. I don't need not uh, tell uh, much on it because we all know. Then previous surgeries on uterus like metroplasty, myomectomy, and even previous C-sections pose uterus on the risk of scar dehiscence or morbidly adherent placenta. So all this history part was very important. I think I'm going in the way how we actually, um, you know, interview the patient or try to gather information from patient. Now, obstetric history is really very, very important. Need not be in the case of a primary gravida, but uh, definitely in case of a multigravida. And here we literally have to put our skills because you have to dig into the history. Just that doctor, I had one child which died, you don't know what happened. There was one stillbirth, you don't know what happened, whether that was because of a severe IUGR, whether it was because of abruption, or it was very low birth weight and they delivered. So we really need to, you know, uh, investigate or interrogate patient thoroughly. Now, in obstetric history, risk factors are recurrent miscarriages more than 10 weeks. Now, patient often says, I had amenorrhea three months, three months and I just bled and doctor did curator and we consider this was a uh, miscarriage more than 10 weeks since she said it is a three months amenorrhea. But mind you, we need to know whether this was a pregnant amenorrhea, urine test was done, ultrasound was done, viability was confirmed, and only then abortion happened. Then we'll say that, yes, we need to put, you know, little, uh, we need to think from the direction of um, thrombophilias and aplas and things like that. So miscarriage history is important. Previous preterm delivery. Occasionally, it is pre, um, preterm deliveries usually are secondary to premature rupture of membrane. But here, what is the term preterm? We should be aware. This is because people are not really, I mean, our mothers are that way, howsoever literate they are, are not really, uh, you know, well versed with the system of how we calculate in weeks. So, eighth month delivery, they'll say, and we don't know if it was a 30 weeks or 34 weeks or 36 weeks. Because many a times, uh, conventional ninth month, it is still 34 to 35 weeks. So best way is to ask is the date of delivery and what was EDD given at that time. So we get precise gestational age. If it was a 37 weeker, 38 weeker, 35 weeker, because then it becomes easy for you to calculate. So this previous obstetric history, you need to ask how many weeks? Was it a spontaneous labor or induced labor? If it was induced labor, was it for some blood pressure problem, some sugar, or doctor thought that baby was too big? Like that, you know, how police investigate or interrogate. Similarly, you need to actually get all this verbal, um, I will not say postmortem, but, uh, you know, all these details we need to ask. What was the birth rate of previous child? And was there any history of blood pressure rise that is PIH or preeclampsia or GDM in previous pregnancy. This previous preeclampsia and pre GDM is also important because in current pregnancy, again, that risk increases. So that history is important. Previous stillbirth and previous unexplained neonatal deaths are also very important. So this obstetric history is really important. Sometimes you need to ask patient apart from the leaving child, did you have any pregnancy loss? And maybe then they'll come out because this is quite common practice. They count only the leaving child. If first pregnancy was some IUFD or something, they may not count and they'll tell, yeah, this is my second child and second pregnancy. In surgical history, previous scars on uterus, metroplasty and myomectomy. I think myomectomy we ask. Uh, if in case of patients say that, uh, yes, I had a fibroid and it was removed, C-section, of course, patients, they tell. But metroplasty, 
I think sometimes uh, while investigating and treating infertility patients, often hysteroscopy is done and hysteroscopic um, lateral metroplasty is done, lateral or fundal to increase the speed. So this kind of metroplasty also you keep in mind because these are the patients in whom if metroplasty was done too extensive and thinning of myometrium, there is a possibility of preterm labor scar uh, and uh, spontaneous uterine rupture. So this history, if patient has undergone some infertility treatment, operative infertility treatment and then conceived is really very, very important. Medical history, I don't think we need to ask. Uh, I mean, I need to repeat. Yes, we need to ask, but I think I have taken this earlier. A uh, few things you can ask. Have you ever been hospitalized before for some illness? So that will give you more, uh, you know, clues for further investigation. Has she ever been transfused? Blood transfusion history, that is also important. Years of marriage, Howsoever trivial this history is, it is important because shorter the duration of pregnancy from marriage, more chance of severe preeclampsia. If at all that preeclampsia happens, severity is much more uh, in such patients. Then, of course, conception history, all we ask, and we know that these pregnancies are at risk for GDM as well as preeclampsia. Now, in general examination, we often uh, see just weight and not height, but height weight is very, very important because BMI is important. And we need not keep calculating BMIs ourselves because there are multiple apps available on even uh, on any smartphone which gives you instant BMI. Why we are interested in BMI is overweight and obesity. As the BMI of a patient approaches 30, chances of preeclampsia and other pregnancy complications are higher. And just for everyone's, uh, you know, quick reminder, we are looking for factors which can lead to either preeclampsia or PPH or infection. Now, obesity is a major risk factor in pregnancy. It is responsible for recurrent miscarriages, miscarriage, stillbirth, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, cardiac dysfunction, Severely obese uh, or very high BMI patients may enter in sleep apnea. The need for C-section and risk for C-section complications such as wound infection is higher in patients who are obese. Not only mothers, but babies also have certain complications. They may face with birth defects, increased incidence of fetal macrosomia, sometimes impaired growth, childhood asthma, and childhood obesity. These last two are none of our business as of now, but as a risk of obese, uh, fetal risk to mother, I think we need to know this. Now, routine screening tests, what we do in pregnancy, again, to find out high-risk patients are, yes, for anemia, hemoglobin check, then if we at all, rather than just doing hemoglobin, if we do CBC, we get to know uh, gestational thrombocytopenia, hypothyroidism, GDM risk, hypertensive disorder of pregnancy risk, and important parameters are blood pressure and proteinuria, asymptomatic bacteriuria, RH typing, and serology. VDRL positive patients are more prone for uh, spontaneous miscarriage. I have just put the frequency at which we should be doing this test and it is very important. Hemoglobin should be checked at least five times till delivery. Then hypothyroidism at least once. Gestational diabetes at least twice, ideally three times in pregnancy. And asymptomatic bacteriuria, if not by culture, at least with dipstick method should be checked at least two to three times in pregnancy. Apart from these screening tests, these are the screening tests for maternal health in general. There are certain other biochemical tests which we often do in pregnancy while checking or while knowing the risk of genetic uh, aneuploidies in baby. And these are beta HCG and PAPE, which are also uh, called as double marker tests. Now, this double marker test consists of 
checking maternal serum or blood for beta HCG and PAPE, which is pregnancy specific placental protein. And then uh, triple marker and quadruple marker are other tests which are done if double marker is missed in first trimester. And these are the tests I have written here. These tests, apart from giving us probability of baby being uh, Down syndrome, T21, and um, other triploid, uh, other aneuploidies, that is number disorders in the baby. If we look at mom values of these tests, they also give us prediction or possibility or the chances or the risk for the mother developing either preterm delivery or um, preeclampsia. Now, remain uh, last four or five, that is adiponectin, SIBG, and bisfatin. Vis These are the newer markers which are used to predict risk of large baby or fetal macrosomia. We are not doing these tests for that. We are also not doing all tests for prediction of um, risk stratification of pregnancy. But again, I need to say that if we miss on double marker, then only probably the role of quadruple marker comes. Just for the sake of stratification, we are not doing triple or quadruple markers if patient has already done her double marker tests. So these tests also tell us risk stratification. Now, last thing is the scan. So labs and scan finding. Scan findings, uh, best time to do scan in pregnancy is 11 to 13.6 week scan. That is first trimester anomaly scan. Here we do get nuchal translucency, uh, that is NT value, the neutrine at PI. This is the time when you measure mean arterial pressure and cervical length. So all these, along with double marker, give us risk stratification. And then second time is the second trimester, where you can again see cervical length, if less than 2.5 centimeter, more possibility of preterm labor, the neutrinite artery PI, mean arterial pressure and liquor. So all these again tell us whether mother will develop or there is a high possibility of mother to develop preeclampsia or low possibility of developing preeclampsia. Now, after doing all this work at, at 12 weeks, then again at 20 weeks, you know, we can stratify our mother and baby as mother low risk, baby low risk, mother high risk, baby high risk, mother high risk, but baby low risk, and mother low risk, but baby is at high risk. Let me explain. These are our common low risk mothers. For example, a young patient, spontaneous conception, normal BMI, low PE risk, and previous good obstetric outcomes. So previous normal deliveries, previous um, normal size baby. So all majority of our patients belong to this low age group patient. Mother is low risk, but baby is at high risk. These are the mothers who have previous stillbirth, previous IUGRs, and on our double marker, very low PAPE moms. So how, how much low? Less than 0.4 mom. You should say that baby is at risk of developing FGR. And if that FGR is too much, can lead to stillbirth. If uh, FGR is, sorry, if FGR, FGR is identified, uh, then it may lead to stillbirth. So here mother is low risk, but baby is at high risk. Then just a minute. Yeah. Then if mother, uh, then mother is at high risk, but baby is at low risk. So patients of anemia, patients of heart disease, babies, they grow normally, but mother is at risk of mortality during pregnancy or at the time of delivery. So these are high risk mothers. Usually mothers with comorbidities are high risk mothers because of their comorbid condition, but baby is not much at risk. And this is the main big group where mother is also at risk of morbidity, mortality, baby is also at the risk of mortality. And which are these disorders? Preeclampsia, preterm labor, GDM, IVF, smoking and obesity. So these are fact these factors which put both mothers and babies at risk.
abortion risk uh, I, this is just one table i think you can we can quickly you know eyeball the table and almost all factors we have covered earlier what is important eventually mother will be at risk for developing preeclampsia if she is primary she is advanced or very young age short duration of marriage family history of preeclampsia preeclampsia in previous pregnancy and uterine pi is very high so she is at risk of preeclampsia also placental abruption fgr risk obese mother malnourished mothers mothers having infections and certain sonography markers and pap and mom so fgr risk and stillbirth risk these factors we can consider together so eventually we, after uh, going through all the history or the labs and this we need to know we need to predict whether this mother can go for preterm delivery whether this mother have a high probability of developing preeclampsia whether this baby is highly likely to go for fgr and if untreated and detected still but in that case let us see whether we have some preventive strategies but before that i like uh, you to go through this small video because we need not calculate all these videos ourselves i mean all these risks ourselves there are good calculators uh uh yeah so if you uh, this is a calculator of fetal medicine foundation and it's freely available for everyone to calculate on the home page on left side you get various um, uh, calculators like how to manage sg and how to calculate the risk for baby so now if i have added these few things i get risk the chance of spontaneous delivery before 34 weeks it becomes 22.9% if there are, there is one event of spontaneous delivery less than 30 weeks then chance is this much so we actually get the possibility of spontaneous delivery in these patients and with this these particular patients we can आई एक मिनिट माझं हे सांगू एक मिनिट एक मिनिट सो इन दीज केसेस इफ दिस इज प्री टर्म डिलिव्हरी देन दीज पेशंट कॅन बी पुट ऑन प्रॉफिलॅक्टिक प्रोजेस्ट्रॉन राईट फ्रॉम सिक्स्टीन वीक्स ऑनवर्ड दे कॅन बी पुट ऑन वजायनल प्रोजेस्ट्रॉन ऑर इंजेक्टेबल प्रोजेस्ट्रॉन एव्हरी वीक role of cervical encerclage it depends uh, because results are variable with various studies so i we may not advocate cervical encerclage everyone at 20 weeks but definitely progesterone prophylaxis can be given prophylactic corticosteroids we should be ready that prophylactic corticosteroids with threaten preterm labor then kangaroo mother care skin to skin contact early bf at least this this part of you know uh, education patient education can be done and definitely readiness can be kept for preterm patients and education patient education can be done now secondly fetal growth restriction so in fetal growth restriction again same fmf calculator tells us preeclampsia and fetal growth restriction calculation now preeclampsia risk as i said if there is a chronic hypertension young patients elderly patients art pregnancies history of preeclampsia high uterine pi or uterine artery notch in mid trimester scan then low dose aspirin can be started to these patients Justosis organization uh, recommends 75 mg mg of low dose aspirin and this is proved with aspire trial but remember aspirin has to be started for being effective from 12th week onward the another uh, diagram shows here correct method of measuring preeclampsia um, blood pressure and i don't want to repeat again because anu has really stressed quite a lot on this um, point but remember um, checking blood pressure on both hands is required while we are calculating preeclampsia risk now another video let me see if it works yes 
So these are various factors which we are supposed to take. I have entered maternal age as 35 years, 65 maternal weight, height. She is South Asian. We all are South Asian. Then you put uterine artery mom, uh, whatever values are there in the NT scan. And after that, when you hit on calculate risk, the report comes that the risk is FGR risk is 1 in 18. Preeclampsia risk is 1 in 40. So this way, once the report comes, you are aware that this baby is at high risk of developing preeclampsia. Um, sorry, this mother is at high risk of developing preeclampsia or baby is at high risk of developing FGR. Now, if we have stratified mothers and babies into high risk and low, uh, low risk, we have these four combinations. High risk mother, high risk baby, high risk mother, low risk baby, high risk mother, uh, sorry, low risk mother, and either baby is high risk or low risk. Now, first category, if mother is high risk and baby is also high risk, how we are going to keep close watch? On the left side are maternal visits, so typically, after 20 weeks, maybe high-risk mother, we may call her every 15 days till 36 weeks and after 36 weeks every week, even to keep an eye on mother. In these patients, early delivery may be required and it is dictated by either maternal disease or if fetus is affected because of the disease and fetus is also at high risk. So for fetal surveillance, we need to do scan from 26 to 28 weeks, every three to four weekly, and sonography and Doppler till delivery. So sonography is going, and Doppler is going to tell us fetal affection and need for early delivery. And maternal surveillance is going to tell us, again, need of early delivery if maternal disease worsens. So this is going to be intense surveillance for high-risk mother and high-risk baby. Now the second category. Here, mother is high risk, but baby is low risk. So you need to have close monitoring of mother's illness and mother. So again, this is a traditional and conventional follow-up. Every 15 days, 36 weeks, every week after 36 weeks. So remember this, I'm, I have, we have started after 20 weeks. 20 weeks, ke baad mein, then we need to go this way. So till 20 weeks, those two visits are common for all groups. and this. 12 weeks and 20 weeks uh, visits, we tend to recalculate or re-stratify the risk amongst mother and baby. So this is the second group where uh, we have close surveillance to the mother. Baby's surveillance, that is ultrasound as per clinical indications, here early delivery may or may not be there and it's totally on maternal disease and very rarely because of fetal affection, because here the baby is at low risk. Now the third group, mother is low risk for any mortality, but baby is high risk, or fetus is at high risk. Here, antenatal visits can be, you know, just at 28 weeks, 34 weeks, and 38 to 40 weeks, those three visits after seventh month of pregnancy, but baby needs close surveillance. And baby needs, again, sonographic surveillance every three to four weekly, depending on the progression of fetal affection. Classical example of this can be a dichorionic pregnancy, where baby is, you know, uh, and put under sonographic surveillance right from uh, 28 weeks, almost every three to four weekly. Or normal mother, singleton pregnancy, where FGR risk or stillbirth risk is pretty high, but mother doesn't have any ailment, she is not at preeclampsia risk, then this, this mother typically needs need not be under close surveillance for mother's sake, but for baby's sake, yes. And the last, um, sorry, in this group, Delivery will be timed only if baby, uh, I mean, fetal de fetus demands or the sonography directs us that mother uh, baby requires early rescue, only then time delivery. And the last part is the low risk mother and low risk baby. Here again, antenatal visits can be 
shorten. I mean, the number can be restricted once at 28 weeks, then at 34 weeks, then 38 to 40 weeks. And baby surveillance can be done with the help of sonography as and when it is required. And these are the mothers which can be allowed to go in spontaneous labor at its own pace. So I think these are the, this is how we need to stratify the risk that mother or baby may have of a bad outcome during pregnancy or at delivery. But also we need to remember that we need to stratify this low risk and high risk once again when patient enters in labor room, that is at the onset of labor. Even low risk mothers and low risk babies become high risk if labor is induced, if it is unduly augmented, if it is neglected and gets prolonged, and for any operative delivery, mother is at risk of PPH, thrombosis, and infections. Baby is at risk of asphyxia, low abgas, birth traumas, and infection. So even low-risk mother and low-risk baby tend to become high risk with labor room practices. And I think there is a, that's why there is a need to have quality improvement of maternity services, even in private sector in India. Thank you so much for patient hearing. And I'll be happy to take questions if at all there are any. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, no questions in the chat box for now. Thank you very much for the strategic layout, for the stratification and unraveling the Kundli of high-risk pregnancy for us. We'll take a minute or to thank uh, Signora for uh, supporting this CME. Uh, their product is Vivamon, which is a high protein maternal nutrition supplement. Thank I'm you, done Signora. with my talk. Sorry, ma'am. Hello. Sucheta, ma'am. Yes, to continue, thank you, Signora, again. And uh, we will move on to our next session with our speaker, Dr. Ashlesha Bagadia, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Ashlesha, ma'am, is a perinatal psychiatrist and health, uh, head of psychotherapy at the Green uh, Oak Initiative. Uh, ma'am has uh, done her fellowship from uh, Toronto, Canada, and is well trained in the UK and Australia as well. Right now, is a faculty of training course of perinatal uh, mental health for OBGY specialists run by RCOG South Zone. Ma'am is also external researcher with NIMHANS and working in the mental health screening systems for antenatal patients in India. Dr. Shlesha, ma'am, on impact of mental health and pregnancy outcome. Dr. Shlesha Bagadia, ma'am, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm just going to uh, share my screen. <clears throat> While Ashlesha ma'am is sharing the scheme, ma'am, we have, Sucheta ma'am, we have a question for you. Uh, can we give chicken pox vaccine to all females who come for preconception counseling and who aren't able to recollect the chicken pox history in their childhood? Uh, usually, if patient can recall history of chicken pox, which often patients they do, if not patient, patient's mother, uh, they can recollect and recall the history. If there is a history of chicken pox, there is no need. But if they come for counseling and there is no clinical chicken pox in them, you can definitely give chicken pox vaccine. Now, remember, chicken pox vaccine is a live viral vaccine. So you should not, given, uh, you should not be giving it in, during pregnancy or during post-ovulation period. So it also means that if patient takes a vaccine of chicken pox, then she should not become pregnant for at least one month, same as rubella. Now, ideal dose for chickenpox vaccine is two, two doses, two months apart. So one now and one after two months. So after second dose, then she is fully immune. Nevertheless, at the time of second dose, if she happens to become pregnant, you can defer 
easily the second dose and she can continue with pregnancy thank you thank you ma'am dr shresha ma'am over to you okay thank you very much uh, thank you uh, to the organizers and to lilac uh, who have uh, you know invited me today i'm really glad to be talking about mental health in uh, uh, pregnancy uh, and outcomes um so uh, even before pregnancy what we now know is that uh, the impact of stress on just fertility uh, is uh, there is a lot of evidence coming up in terms of uh, the risk that psychosocial stresses cause on reproductive suppression and uh, there are also some studies that suggest that uh, uh, this risk is higher in younger women and those who are unskilled except for those who are uh, working very high stress jobs so even before they start conceiving or planning conception their fertility is getting affected by stress or any pre existing uh, mental health issues uh, so these women then become uh, you know at higher risk of uh, seeking ivf treatment uh, are already getting uh, dejected depressed and anxious when they have uh, failed uh, pregnancies multiple conceptions and unable to conceive so this is the background that some of the women may be coming to you already either they are coming with precious pregnancy um or they have already ha experienced stress from not being able to conceive so there is a percentage of women who may already be entering the pregnancy with this and it's important to keep that in mind even before you see them or even uh, uh, you know what what might be going on what in their lives even before they become pregnant but if you think about pregnancy the major me mental health issues that you uh, are likely to see and now that now we are seeing more and more commonly uh, is uh, anxiety depression trauma related responses and the, what is rare psychosis is rare and it still remains rare um so if you see someone with anxiety they usually present with excessive worries uh, alternate antenatal care when i say altered antenatal care it means either they are extremely anxious and re seeking reassurances constantly you know getting worried about the smallest of things or they are avoiding they don't want to hear anything even if it is uh, uh, you know like a basic uh, requirement of blood test they don't want to know they are worried that something will be uh, come out wrong so they they avoid uh, antenatal care and they might have obsessive thoughts of negative thoughts or just constantly thinking about what may happen how will it go depression in 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 general depression you might see someone as withdrawn but in pregnancy depression often presents with moods of going up and down and they are not able to come out of the low mood um and they might withdraw because uh, postnatally there is a little bit of awareness now with uh, women sort of saying okay we know that postnatally our mood will go down but in pregnancy if their mood goes down they are not able to come to terms with it they feel like okay this is unusual i'm supposed to be happy everyone is expecting me to be happy and i'm not feeling happy so they are less likely to report it they feel guilty that they must be the only one who must be feeling like this so depression in pregnancy is really important to keep in mind because they are less likely to report it they are likely to withdraw from everyone and what we are seeing more commonly and especially in the covid times or especially in times where women are stuck uh, you know at home with uh, stressful relatives stressful family members they have a lot of external stress they might be subjected to violence they might just be managing you know from one stress to the other so they barely coping from one crisis to the other so they might have a lot of uh heightened anxiety heightened uh, stress related to their ex external environment and psychosis of course uh, you might anticipate in someone who has a pre existing mental illness uh, like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder um, or they may uh, already be on medication and stable and then your sort of job becomes more about uh, managing the medication liaising with the mental health services um but the reason i just gave you this overview is it's important to think about the common mental disorders like anxiety depression and uh, stress because these are not picked up uh, and they are less likely to report it and they are more likely to just stop medications on their own without uh, seeking consultation and then it becomes a uh, sort of uh, you know a point to consider whether should you be picking up on this should you be screening this if we don't do anything is it going to affect uh, the pregnancy or not is it going to affect the fetal growth and that becomes a key area to keep in mind so what actually happens on uh, antenatal care of these women if they are struggling with uh, mental illness even if it is of a low uh, degree uh, like i mentioned they might uh, seek uh, their their 
uh, ability or capacity or motivation to seek timely antenatal care is affected. Uh, often diet is inadequate. They might uh, not be supplementing themselves well. There is uh, an, a use of tobacco, alcohol, and other harmful substances to cope. And this, uh, you know, I used to think that this is uh, probably seen in, especially alcohol is probably seen in uh, high upper middle class. But I think now we are getting evidence that it is seen even in, um, you know, in villages where uh, they uh, don't know how else to cope. And uh, use of tobacco is also uh, sort of on the rise. Use of other harmful substances, uh, perhaps in the preconception period more, and they're less likely to do it in pregnancy. The, the numbers are still small compared to what uh, you would anticipate, but they're still there. Uh, risk of self-harm and suicide is another big one that uh, has to be kept in mind and often goes unnoticed, especially self-harm uh, as a way of coping, which can accidentally lead to more severe harm. The impact it has on uh, antenatal care, now we have several studies and I'm happy to share them with you later on, is that untreated anxiety or untreated depression uh, can lead to preterm birth even when other factors are controlled for um, and can also uh, lead to poor fetal growth. So small for weight uh, babies are uh, often seen when the mother has untreated mental illness. Uh, the postnatal development uh, and uh, fetal development antenatally and postnatally is also affected when the mental illness is uh, untreated. Uh, this I thought is really important and I, I kind of uh, was little listening to the previous two talks and I hope that you know in your history taking and in your risk stratification, uh, the aspect of mental health also gets included because it does have, uh, it does would classify the mother and the baby in high risk if not addressed. And of course, if there is untreated mental illness in the uh, pregnancy, then th the chances of the mother becoming uh, depressed postnatally are much higher because her the protective hormones are even less. And uh, now we also know without fail that if a woman is likely to become mentally unwell or succumb to mental stress at any point in her life, the perinatal period is the highest risk point where she goes through a maximum amount of change hormonally, physically, emotionally in a very short span of time. So if you think about you know, the entire lifespan, this is the time of life where uh, everything changes very suddenly for a, over a very short period of time. So that time, if she's vulnerable, if she has some genetic vulnerability or any other vulnerability, this is her highest risk period to develop a mental health issue. And it's really important for us to keep that in mind. Of course, the common things you may have heard of, which may happen after birth, is uh, things like baby blues, which usually come on in the first few days and can last about two weeks. They are very common, about 75 to 80% and tend to settle down. So uh, as a sort of assessment point, usually mental health assessments should not be done, uh, you know, or at least uh, intervention should not be uh, aimed in the first two weeks after uh, delivery, especially if only what you're noticing is sort of anxiety and uh, uh, low grade stress and them crying. Because after first two weeks is when they start settling and that is when you need to then uh, see if they need uh, like a mental health review. Postnatal psychosis or pupural psychosis develops within the first few weeks and can come on very suddenly. And uh, it is usually picked up quite well by most uh, obstetric uh, services, even including uh, obstetric nurses, midwives, because it is completely out of character. Uh, there is paranoid thoughts. They might not want to look at the baby. They might be scared about the baby or they might be scared that others might be trying to harm the baby. And often they will prevent uh, you know, medical intervention. So the baby needs to be taken to NICU or needs to be taken for uh, a vaccine that they will not allow. So immediately uh, psychosis gets picked up. Depression is the one, the postnatal depression is the one that uh, often tends to slip uh, and for, fall through the cracks because it tends to develop about six to eight weeks after delivery. And if you think about you know, your uh, pregnant women, this is the time when they, are, they have stopped almost, you would have done the follow-up after delivery. And if there are no complications, uh, I'm guessing, you know, you, you will hand over, you'll say, okay, thank you. And the, you're less likely to see them. About the one month mark is when they stop seeing. So after nine and a half months of uh, regular contact with uh, someone, they now stop seeing uh, a, a clinician who, who is asking about them. The next clinician they go to is for their baby and all uh, attention goes on the baby. So the mother is uh, not really the focus of attention anymore. 
and uh, that is uh, a time where she can slip because that is when depression sets in and it's not because she is not a focus there are a whole lot of other factors but it doesn't get picked up easily because postnatal depression comes after services are stopped for her anxiety can occur any time in the first year uh, after delivery and the risk period for any postnatal uh, condition to develop now we are noticing it lasts almost up to 2 years before we used to think a 6 to 9 months now we know that up to 2 years the risk of developing any postnatal mental health issue uh, would come under the perinatal depression or perinatal stage and it, it needs to be kept in mind especially if uh, some families are planning to have a second child very soon after it ha- it's happening less people do like to have a gap but if they want to have a child soon after the first one uh, especially if they feel like they should grow up together it's important to note that uh, for 2 years and especially if they've had mental health issues that for 2 years they, uh, they need to really be stabilizing themselves mentally before they start planning another one and postnatal depression how it presents is that the mother uh, apart from the usual depressive symptoms which are of not being able to sleep not uh, feeling uh, joy in anything in life crying a lot um, you know not being able to eat properly uh, feeling la- really lacking in energy so apart from those uh, symptoms of depression there are specific ones that you see more commonly in women with postnatal depression worries about being around the baby worries about harming the baby without intending to so they they sort of think what if i drop the baby what if i do something wrong and the baby will get hurt and they find it very hard to bond with the baby uh, they are usually you will find them uh, giving away the baby to someone else ah you like look after now the baby is playing so well with you uh, and then because they are not able to cheer the baby up or play with the baby because they are depressed babies don't respond to them very well also so then they start having thoughts of guilt you know that they are not able to bond with the baby the baby doesn't love them and so it becomes a really vicious cycle for them women also have intrusive thoughts of harming the baby or regret that they've had the baby or they may have thoughts of self harm or suicide uh this there is another condition you know like personality disorders are enduring personality disorders which may have uh, uh low self esteem throughout their life and they you might see them decompensating during pregnancy or postpartum where they have very high uh, dysregulation in their moods they may become aggressive or violent very angry difficulty managing their anger and uh, they may have a long standing history of increased suicidality the difficulty with these uh, women is that they may not be going through a crisis when they are pregnant so you may not pick up on anything and they are more likely to decompensate when they are going through a crisis of some kind either from a external stressor or something that's upset them and only then everything will unravel so uh, what are the chances now these are figures that we are noticing and we we feel like they might have changed even more recently that anxiety and depression in pregnancy is uh, 10 to 20% of what we know of which are reported but uh, there is uh, some new evidence that's coming up that it may be higher than this uh, so there uh, women are almost as likely to get depression in pregnancy as they are to get di- diabetes uh, but there is no screening at the moment at least no streamline nationalized screening for mental health issues in pregnancy um they have given you the other figure baby blues is about 75 to 80% postnatal depression is 20 to 30% some studies have quoted up to 40% it's unclear whether uh, it is that high or it was uh, you know that those studies are uh, not well validated yet but definitely about a third of women are likely to have mental health issues uh, and impact on the pregnancy so it's really important to keep that in mind uh there are a whole range of causes uh, which you may be aware of uh, most of them get screened for in pregnancy so biological causes things that you might be screening uh, just for a good pregnancy outcome if they have any of these conditions it's important to then also check that their mental health is okay because thyroid uh, dysfunction can impact on mental health anemia vitamin b12 vitamin d and hypertension diabetes can impact on their mental health independently whether they're pregnant or not so this ca- uh, it's important to keep this in mind asking for any family history of uh, mental health issues especially during pregnancy for uh, uh, the mother of the baby and uh, mother of the your patient is important to ask um of course external uh-huh. factors like i mentioned the psychosocial factors like relationship difficulties uh, lack of support now this is an, another thing that has uh, become quite uh, common because we have a lot of migrant population you know people are working in cities away from their uh, families of origin not always uh, mother is able to come and stay with them 
sometimes they are not able to stay for long periods with their mother like they would have liked to uh, so they 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 are or they might want to do it after delivery so during pregnancy they are more likely to stay in uh, in the city where they are working or where with their in-laws so there is a lack of support that we are seeing more and more that's happening in the migrant migrant indian population which are living in different cities uh, and it we have to not assume that they will have other people around them because that has an impact on mental health any history of lifetime trauma can impact mental health during the perinatal period financial stress of course uh, work related stress and being a single parent these can be the external causes and uh, this you will be very familiar with this any pregnancy related causes like unplanned unwanted pregnancies gender of the baby multiple babies complications during pregnancy or delivery complications with breastfeeding or medical complications in the baby so the reason i i think i mean i wanted to highlight this i often show this to my patients also that there are so many things that can contribute to their mental health it is not just them often they are thinking or they are being told by their family family also you just have to you know think positive if there are so many things that can contribute it's important for them to know that there are there are possibility of other things that is contributing to my mood it is not just me deliberately feeling low or deliberately getting anxious and even but as a, a response to that that other things may have caused your uh, mental health issues but you are the one who's going to have to do something about it and i can connect you to the right people to get help and that is something that's really important for them to try and understand and also for us to educate the family this is really important for us to think of right now we have enough studies and more developing that there is significant association between poor antenatal mental health and impaired cognitive development in the fetus um and i often um mention this to families and patients who are worried about side effects of medication one question i get often asked is you know brain damage will occur if i take medications or if i take anything during pregnancy but it, uh, it's important equally for us to talk about the damage that not taking medication or the damage from illness uh, that can occur if they let the illness continue during pregnancy uh neurocognitive impairments have been found in general cognitive development of the baby in attention regulation in iq in working memory um and and this is not even just you know like severe illness like schizophrenia or bipolar this is even just prenatal stress uh and so if you look at the study that was done by bergman in 2007 they found that just prenatal stress accounted for all so much of variability 70% of variability in cognitive ability at 17 months post delivery so uh, depression and anxiety which are way more common can actually impact on cognitive uh, development of the child and put them at a higher risk of further mental health uh, issues in their life uh this is a uh, kind of uh, you know a uh, flow chart that demonstrate that if there is a heightened uh, anxiety in a mother during pregnancy uh, that actually affects the hpa axis and it actually causes a heightened cortisol response in the child and it it crosses the placental barrier so the fetus cortisol response goes up and it can alter the hippocampus and alter the hpa axis in the fetus so the newborn is already for, uh, born with a heightened uh, altered hpa axis and heightened sensitivity to stress and they are lesser uh, you know they they are more difficult to uh, calm down they are more fussy and they are more at risk of Uh, becoming more anxious when other you know they are exposed to other life events as they grow up so what can be done um one of the things especially you know all uh, the audience here you are at the point where uh, women are most likely to seek uh, medical contact so if you look at generally healthy women they are uh, unlikely to come into contact with uh, medical services Uh, but during their pregnancy and postpartum is when they have the highest contact with any kind of health service so it's like an opportune time for us to uh, intervene or pick up or screen for mental health issues um but it is not enough if only you are screening right we also have to be advising the uh, family members the other staff the nurses so generally everywhere there needs to be a, a reduced stigma to enable them to seek help in one of the clinics where i work the obstetrician is uh, you know in in the same flow she seeing her patients she sends them to me by the time they come out of the obstetrician's office and they have to walk across in the same flow it's like barely 2 minutes of walk 
Uh, there are enough people who are dissuading the patient. Really? Do you need to see the counselor? Do you need to see the psychiatrist? No, 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 nothing is Don't worry, we will look after you. So there are enough people who are telling them not to come. That, that dissuades them that even if you might suggest them, you know, that they are, less li they are likely to not want to seek help. So a lot has to be done in terms of uh, encouraging them to seek help and including family and, uh, you know, the extended family in uh, ensuring that uh, mother's emotional well-being has to be addressed in pregnancy just as importantly as physical well-being. That can be uh, something that needs to happen. Um, so asking profession, as professionals, all professionals working in the perinatal field, asking about emotional health, uh, asking about uh, you know risk, especially ignoring risk is something that cannot be done, educating and encouraging family members. I'll talk a little bit about screening systems. So it's really important to think what, what kind of mental health screening you might be doing and can you do it confidentially? So to aim for at least one consultation, if not more, but at least one consultation in privacy of your uh, uh, patients. Now, I, I don't quite know the kind of setting everyone is in, but I do know that most women, uh, most uh, obstetricians are able to see their patients privately. But if they are accompanied by a caregiver, their mother or mother-in-law or husband, uh, they may often not be very comfortable if that, that is the only time you screen for mental health. So it's important that it's done confidentially. And if you do pick up on something, if you do pick up on some mental health issues, not to hesitate to get some feedback from your mental health colleagues as to see how to proceed further. So there are some current screening systems that ex uh, exist worldwide. Uh, the most common one that is there in other countries is called the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. It's a 10 item questionnaire and it's widely used in many English countries uh, and non-English speaking countries as well. <clears throat> it has some limitations which I'll go through. There is also a simple Wooly two item questionnaire which is mostly used in uh, UK. It has uh, just two simple questions. Over the past month, have you been feeling down, depressed or hopeless? Or have you been bothered by little interest or pleasure in doing things? Now this picks up um, symptoms of depression, but may not address uh, anxiety. The problem with a lot of these English screening tools is that uh, their questions are very, uh, you know, um, sort of uh, English, uh, centric. So people who are very comfortable with English will be able to understand the questions. But things like I've been able to laugh and see the funny side of things, unless you translate it to something colloquial and uh, uh, understandable, they don't really have a, a meaning. Things have been getting on top of me. Uh, you know, it's not really a very useful kind of question in the Indian setting. Um, and very leading also the questions can be that are you so unhappy that you're not sleeping? It becomes a very leading and closed question and prevents us from actually understanding what's going on. So with the result of that, there are high rates of false positives, high variability between interviewers. And what we found in different countries is that uh, the cutoff scores are very variable to actually pick up uh, mental health issues. And in fact, in um, uh, South Asian countries, uh, you need a really low cutoff to actually pick up. Then the purpose of the screening tool itself becomes, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, not very valuable. And other thing is that they may test on a, the score may be low in the beginning, but they need to be retested to actually pick up something. So uh, if you don't have any other access, then it's all right to do a screening tool at least so that you're doing something. But there are other screening devices. Uh, so there is a tool that has been developed by uh, team at uh, Nimhans with some of us external researchers. It's called Prep M. Right now, it's in the process of validation, but it is uh, free and easily available. Um, and what we are looking at here is uh, really looking at the psychosocial risk factors, because what we also realize with uh, a lot of our women is when you ask them how are you feeling or is your mood low, they are likely to say no many times because they don't want you to dig up anything. But if you ask them of uh, risk factors that can contribute to their mental health problems they are more likely to share them. So you might pick up, pick, up, uh, pick up on some risk factors like their age, literacy level, lack of social support. Uh, some of this were covered in the history, their psychosocial history. Uh, so the things that are highlighted in red are the ones that are directly linked in previous studies to mental health issues. So lack of social support is one, domestic violence another one, past history of mental health issues, suicidal thoughts. And also, if you can't ask anything else, and let's say you just ask them, do you want to see a mental health professional? And if they answer yes, then that is another sort of, uh, uh, you know, pointer to refer to a mental health professional. 
apart from the screening, uh, there are some conditions, obviously, to have a low threshold to refer to a mental health professional is if they have a physical or intellectual disability, uh, if they have a cognitive impairment or brain injury, if you can see obvious signs of self-neglect, self-harm, suicidal thoughts or intent, of course, if there is substance misuse, uh, if you suspect domestic violence and abuse, if there is suspected child maltreatment with uh, the other child or uh, with the uh, you know, baby, medical complications with high level of stress or neonatal complications with high levels of stress, have a low threshold to refer this to a counselor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist in your network. Some of the possible ways in which you could open screening questions is to normalize it, that this is something you ask everybody, that you haven't picked up something specially in them. You're just asking this because you ask this to everybody. I see many pregnant women every day. I always check their mental health because this can be a difficult time for women. So it's important to sort of open up, you know, reassure them a little bit, build a little rapport, and uh, then start asking. If you suddenly start asking out of the blue, they'll be caught off guard and they're less likely to uh, open up. You might also sort of, uh, you know, just know if you notice them getting uh, overwhelmed because you're sharing something from the scan or you're telling them about, uh, you know, a risk factor. So you might want to sort of pause there. Are you getting overwhelmed? And not just from a medical point of view. I think medically you might be able to do that very well, but you might want to pause and wait till they've absorbed the information and ask if they want to talk more about how they're feeling, not just about how much they've understood the risk factor and how they're going to manage. And you can also sort of uh, say sometimes stress can be unbearable. You may feel like ending your life. Have you had any such thoughts? It's easy to open it up and slowly and say, maybe sometimes this can be too hard. Have you had any such thoughts? Rather than just asking, are you suicidal? Also remember to include the husband. We often, nowadays husbands are very hands-on and it's really important to include them because they might also be getting overwhelmed or they might not know how to help their wife who is getting overwhelmed. So asking both of them, how are you coping with all these changes? There's so many changes are happening in your life. How are you coping? Would you like some help? So it's useful to sort of build it in rather than just jump to it straight away. There's a very nice article that is there. Uh, it's uh, uh, called How to Ask and How to Help. Um, and I'm happy to share this uh, uh, with uh, the organizers later. Um, it, it, the, some of the highlights from that article is like I mentioned earlier, choosing a time when you can talk to them alone and always starting with reassuring opening statements. Don't go straight away for the closed questions. Build a little bit of rapport. Uh, also reassure them that it will be confidential. Whatever you tell them, unless you're really worried, uh, you, you know, that you will uh, sort of won't tell their husband not to hit them if they're uh, worried about domestic violence. That is another really important point to keep in mind that if you are worried about domestic violence, um, often the women are not ready to stop uh, being with their partner. They're not ready to leave the house. So they may be worried that if you bring it up with their husband or if you tell their husband not to hit them, the violence will increase. So it's important to just talk to them and connect them to the domestic uh, violence helplines. Um, and of course, if you, I think that there are lots of obstetricians that I know who are working actively in the field. So if you're working actively in the field, you might already know this. You may already have some uh, resources uh, or ways to connect them, but it's really important to respect their confidentiality uh, that they may not want to their husband to be confronted just yet. And normalizing, like I said, need for asking about mental health issues um, and keep them non-judgmental. You know, uh, sometimes we may have our own beliefs about how certain things have to be done. Uh, their beliefs might be different. They may choose, like I said, they may choose to stay with a violent husband because he's providing for the children. They may choose to do certain things because they are uh, uh, trying to manage their anxiety. So it's important that we stay as non-judgmental as possible. Uh, and to try and explore concerns rather than eliciting symptoms. And when you first uh, talk to them about this or when they first open up, to resist the urge to give advice straight away. Because uh, that, will, that will close the loop immediately and they won't be able to share anything. Of course, it may be very difficult for you to you know, explore completely because uh, it's, you don't have the time. I know it's busy OPDs, but it's just important to not straight away give advice. Even if you say, okay, you know, we should talk more about this. Maybe next time we'll talk a little bit more and then I can give you some options of who else you could talk to. So when you straight away give advice and say, don't worry, it'll be fine. Or you know, give, ask them, give them something to fix it straight away, which we are more likely to do or feel like doing. 
then it closes the sort of you know uh, loop of com communication. There is a uh, sorry. So last year, uh, we have started doing a short course for obstetricians uh, organized by Indian Psychiatric Society and the All India Coordinating Committee of RCOG South Zone. And uh, this is uh, uh, quite a useful course, in my opinion, especially for obstetricians. And it gives an overview of uh, uh, all the perinatal mental health issues that you can uh, address, how you can address or what can you do when you need to, when you can't do something yourself, how can you refer them on? Uh, the next one, I think, is end of uh, June, um, and you might get uh, the flyers in your uh, regular circulation. If not, you can reach out to me, and I'm happy to, um, you know, share the details whenever the dates come out. Um, I think I will stop there. If you have any other questions, uh, you're welcome to email me, uh, or I'm happy to address questions now also. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the very informative session. Uh, an eye-opening session on mental health uh, and the impact that it has antenatally and perinatally and postnatally. Uh, uh, now I would like to thank uh, Lilac Insights for supporting this webinar. Uh, Lilac Insight has launched a new program called At Ease. Uh, that uh, is a women's mental health program and they cater services uh, not only to pregnant women, uh, but to also other uh, women and women at workplace and other conditions during the reproductive lifespan in total. So we have uh, Ms. Richa Vaishisht who is going to uh, say, uh, who has a small presentation to make about the uh, program that they have launched. Ms. Richa. Hello, thank you. Thank you for introducing me. And uh, good afternoon, everyone, lovely doctors, and hope you are all having a lovely uh, Learn It Sunday. I attended a couple of webinars, and I'm, I mean, I think it has been really informative. And um, thank you, Dr. Shresha, for such a, you know, informative session on perinatal mental health and uh, the importance on, you know, introducing uh, mental health screening while we are talking about, uh, you know, the prenatal period, the postnatal period, because I think somehow, even in the mental health uh, areas, somehow the focus on perinatal mental health is not too strong, you know, in a country like India. So I think it is so important to have this conversation. Uh, so yes, my name is Richa Vashisht. My pronouns are she and her. And I work as a chief mental health expert at Lilac Insights. And, uh, you know, as, as someone just correctly mentioned, we have started... Um, a new program. So I'm just going to quickly pull up a slide. I'm not going to take more than two minutes, actually. Yes. So, um, so I've done my master's in clinical psychology, and I've been working in the space of mental health for the last seven years. And, uh, you know, I think with uh, the kind of work that Lilac Insights has been doing till now, we realized that we had to kind of bridge the gap and, uh, you know, offer not only physical or medical services, but offer also offer mental health services. And that's where, you know, at ease as a program was born. So at ease is, you know, I would say a woman's program, but I would say that it's an, it is an inclusive women's program. So we offer support to women, you know, with different stories, women of all kinds, women coming from different classes. And of course we offer, um, evidence-based services to, you know, support people who show, let's say, you know, symptoms of anxiety, depression, a lot of what Dr. Ashlesha has already kind of spoken about. And um, why is it important to kind of talk about women's mental health or, you know, of, of a, a lady who's pregnant or of a, you know, new, new mother? Um, why is it important to talk about it, especially in the current Indian scenario? Because first of all, you know, we live in a country where mental health is a very hush-hush conversation. We don't really talk about it. Uh, it's also considered as a last resort. Like if I can kind of manage my issues and symptoms on my own, I will do that. But uh, only once, you know, it's it's a very difficult situation. Will, it, will I kind of go and see, uh, you know, a psychiatrist or a psychologist? And this is something that I usually kind of ask people during webinars that, you know, how many of us have actually gone for a therapy session? And, uh, you know, if this was a session happening, you know, where I would see a lot of people, I would have asked this question and not too many hands would actually come up. 
and that's the situation in the country while we are talking about you know mental health and further it is even more difficult for women because of a lot of societal pressures that women have to face uh, you know women also have this uh, role of being strong you know nurturing caregivers for friends for families for communities that gets even more difficult for a woman to actually reach out for mental health support so you know to kind of bridge that gap um, at ease as a program you know by lila like insights is offering um, a rights based approach an intersectional approach a multicultural approach you know during counseling and therapy in these five areas and when we look at these five areas whether it is mental health conditions in women you know all of what dr ashlesha kind of mentioned a while back you know whether we are wanting to then understand uh, issues that women uh, and family uh, women are facing at home you know with family so whether it is any form of abuse whether it is emotional abuse uh, physical abuse sexual abuse you know whether it is issues at home not getting the right kind of help i think covid 19 has also uh, increased the kind of challenges that women are facing at home uh then we are also offering support to women uh, at workspaces so i think women at workspaces and especially married women with children it can be a very difficult space for them to kind of maintain a work life balance i'm sure a lot of you will also relate to this uh so our our um our agenda or our goal is to kind of offer our experts and our services to be able to kind of uh, you know live a life at ease um you know because everybody experiences mental health issues you know whether it is to do with gender identity or sexuality we are also offering services there and the main thing is you know whether uh, in the reproductive lifespan so from from the time when someone is turning 18 because we offer services to people above the age of 18 till the time you know you are uh, planning your pregnancy are uh, you pregnant after delivery post uh, you know menopause we are here to offer mental health support for women you know of all types whatever it is that you're facing you can absolutely reach out to us we have uh, three experts already on board in the next month we're looking at you know uh, increasing our experts panel so we have dr rukshada sayada who is an advisor who's also a psychiatrist on board uh, you know she and dr shlesha know each other pretty well actually there are both uh, both of them are a part of the indian psychiatric society uh, you know then there is me we have also somebody named sadav vida uh, we are all we are all people working in the space of mental health trying to kind of create a safe space for women to be able to voice whatever it is that they are feeling and that's our main aim so um as you know as a doctor who's listening to this conversation right now now that we've understood the importance of perinatal mental health if you feel that there is somebody who would you know require services whether it is counseling therapy feel free to you know reach out to us our uh, website our phone number is both displayed over here you can take a screenshot of this particular page and uh, you know we are open to taking appointments so happy to kind of work collaboratively so that we can offer uh, good services to our patients at the end of it and um, whether it is physical health or mental health everybody needs to be holistically healthy so yes thank you thank you everybody for you know your time and for uh, understanding the importance of ment mental health thank you thank you mr shah thank you for introducing us to atis and we'll surely get through and try to bridge in the gap uh moving on to our last session for the day our panel discussion uh the moderator for the panel discussion is uh, dr manisha matkar ma'am manisha ma'am is the president of kargar doctors association she is a consultant at yes, anjini maternity home and a faculty at yeah, yeah, yeah. dental dr manisha ma'am yes good afternoon everyone um i um on the behalf of uh, nmox team i welcome all the panelists um i know um, they have already been introduced dr uh, anuvij ma'am dr sucheta ma'am uh, dr anuja thomas dr ashlesha bagria and uh, dr snehal ma'am so uh, i'll share the screen
just a minute. I'm going to take them out. This is how we go. Leech. 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 And your screen is not seen as yet. Sorry, uh, technical problem. I'll uh, start sharing my screen now. Hello. Um, just a minute. Yes. Very uh, uh, well versed with this. Uh, uh, Manisha, you will have to first open up your presentation and the background. Yes. Then That's from the Zoom, you will have to share screen. Only when the presentation is open, you will be able to see. Yes, the presentation is open, but there uh, is some uh, uh, technical problems which I am not able to. Uh, Handle right away. I'm sending. I'm uh, trying to send the presentation to Pradnya so that she can help me in that. Uh, so till the presentation gets loaded, uh, anybody else wants to ask any questions to any of the panelists, uh, they can go ahead and ask the questions. I just have a comment or suggestion, Doctor Ashlesha. Good uh, that you you know brought up this mental health topic. Because I've been saying that um, uh, now we have prenatal diagnosis, PGD, but many a times uh, the couple is straight away given advice of sperm donation and ovum donation. And for, uh, you know, having the child, they for a while, they keep aside their depression. But if sperm is donated, the husband is depressed for life for not accepting the child and ovum donation. It is quite overlooked. And the couple comes and when they, they know that there was a way to diagnose, we could have done PGD or prenatal diagnosis and then they are relieved. So there are so many aspects of mental health which were being overlooked. But as you said rightly, that unless we look for it, uh, and especially during Corona pandemic, I have seen that, um, you know, people having done prenatal diagnosis, normal baby, and in spite of bad obstetric history, they again wanted a normal child. They were, they were wanting to spend because they thought that, you know, life is not very sure. And then we want somebody to take care of our child or our abnormal child. So a lot of problems in mental health and it, it's going to increase. I mean, there is, there is no denial about it. So there is an increasing need uh, for adolescent girls to mothers and our, even, even husbands. Hmm. So... I completely agree. Again, uh, again, I would like to make a comment and suggest kind suggestion for uh, Dr. Aslesha. 
if you can actually formulate question as to find out depression or other things in indian perspective and you know forward it to our society we can will be happy to uh, relay that information and use that information in our patients find out which people who need mental health assistance and that way that is the way forward because i have gone through this um, british or english or american questionnaires which are not at all appropriate with our society background you know so that is a suggestion and i think you can take it as a priority and make it available for us yes no thank you very much i uh, completely agree and in fact we have uh, designed a questionnaire and uh, we will i will share it with you Uh, i think you can start using it uh, even without while we are still waiting for the validation cut off scores correct but uh, so i'll share it's called prep and uh, it is along with nimhans that was prepared so with other obstetricians in the panel as well so i'll share it with you uh, maybe i'll send it to uh, purva i think um, yeah. and she can share it with everyone um and also just in response to dr snehal's uh, point i think it's absolutely right you know that this is just going to go up uh, we did a focus group a uh, few years ago with uh, uh, you know in the the uh, asha workers and the pregnant women who were co- coming there and we just asked them you know uh, what will be the barriers how, what will help you open up to and uh, talk about your mental health so there were many of them said if we get asked then we will uh, talk about it but if nobody asks us then uh, we don't we feel we can't bring it up you know so one of the thing that theme that came out from that discussion was that uh, if uh, our doctors ask us about it then we will open up so i'm hoping that you know more of us can ask them about it so we need to initiate basically so that from the initiation has to come from yeah. us yeah so manisha uh, you can start yeah, asking questions yeah by the by the mean time i'll start the questions uh, okay. the um, slide show will uh, come along when it is available so i just you know, a uh, first question um, india's mar- maternal mortality rate in 2007 to 9 it was 212 uh, in 14 16 it uh, reduced to 130 15 16 122 and 16 18 113 so near about there is 26.9% uh, decrease in maternal deaths due to preventable causes related to pregnancy and childbirth and um, the latest target set for mmr is at 70 by 2030 so we have a huge responsibility in um, achieving this target till now we have done an excellent job because of the antenatal care um, the mmr has reduced to a significant count so there there's a saying alone we can do so little together we can do so much it was said by helen keller so togetherly we have achieved a long distance and good um, uh, landmark uh, togetherly we have achieved a um, good achievable uh, heights still to go uh, further more we uh, will be uh, working together a discussion or a panel discussion helps to um, update our uh, information our knowledge and togetherly we can achieve this target also next pradnya so uh, i would like to ask um, uh, sucheta madam what would be the appropriate time for doing routine antenatal care investigations like the patient is coming for the first time and uh, she comes in fifth month so what would be the or if the patient comes in pre counseling um, stage of uh, pregnancy pre conception stage and then what would be uh, telling her to okay you come in this Thank month you. On that. You. So, yeah man can you guide me i i got your question so if patient comes uh, prior to pregnancy then i like to do few things like thalassemia screening i'll be doing most of the thalassemia tests i mean the screening test is by doing electrophoresis electrophoresis which also gives us a proportion of hba1c so that is an advantage of doing um, thalassemia screening as early as possible because as a side effect you get to know value of hba1c and if it's not too high you know patient is at risk 
not diabetic pre diabetic you know so that is background yeah. information so if you are doing a test lab yeah, test pre pregnancy yeah, i'll be doing yeah. thalassemia test i'll be doing her hemoglobin concentration and cbc uh, test her blood group and rh type if possible rubella antibody so these are the four main tests and along with tsh serum tsh so these are four or five screening tests i'll be doing prior to pregnancy if at all patient happens to come in ropd but if patient comes for the first time when she is become pregnant in first trimester then at her first visit i'll be doing all important investigations including blood group i think we all know this among serology we do hb um, hepatitis b antigen then uh, hiv and vdrl and rubella antibody so these four are antibody tests then blood group rh type cbc thyroid urine and blood group so i think all these tests if patient is not vomiting in first trimester i i might as well finish with glucose challenge test or glucose uh, tolerance test in first trimester itself so first time because lot of information you get from this investigation and you change your prescriptions accordingly so at first point of contact baseline labs i'll definitely advise okay ma'am thank you next slide pradhan um anu ma'am um ma'am is there anu ma'am is there yeah 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 ma'am uh, when should we repeat anu, the you need to unmute when should we repeat yeah. the investigations uh, once the patient has done the basic investigations and when and what investigations to be re uh, repeated at what frequency see if all her baseline investigations are normal then probably we will repeat them once in each trimester but if the baseline investigations show some abnormality let's say her hemoglobin is 8 and you have instituted a uh, intervention in the form of oral iron or iv iron then definitely you would like to see after 2 or 3 weeks what is the response so that depends on what the levels uh, are at the baseline test okay ma'am otherwise all investigations not all investigations blood group is going to remain same we will same. not repeat it so all the variables we will repeat at least once in uh, each uh, trimester as for example like when we do the gct at 24 weeks we do thyroid and cbc along with that and then in the in the last trimester uh, we would like to repeat serology also because that Uh, has a window period of six months. If we have done in first trimester, we need to do HIV, Australia antigen, HCV repeated at the just before delivery at around thirty-six weeks. Along with that, in the third trimester again, uh, hemoglobin and uh, urine needs to be repeated. Ma'am, do we repeat a GCT even if it is normal in third trimester, ma'am? your screening test has to be done only once keep it in mind any screening test whatever it is has to be done only once okay. if 24 weeks gct is negative you need not repeat it okay. but if your screening test shows glucose intolerance meaning 120 and 140 in between then you need to follow this up patient with a proper gtt or a fasting pp maybe every month depending on what the previous level is and what how effective your uh, intervention is okay ma'am thank you next slide please um anuja uh, i would like to hear from you what is asymptomatic bacteria how to screen for it and how to treat for it Anuja, please unmute yourself. Ah, uh, sorry. Asymptomatic bacteriuria is the presence of ah uh, bacteriuria without symptoms, and we consider the significant bacteriuria as more than one lakh coliform units in the ah uh, urine. So this is basically asymptomatic. The lady is the pregnant woman is not having any symptoms, and still we are identifying it. so as the low resource setting uh, we have discussed the urine routine uh, gram staining or that will just give us you know how many wbcs per count as well the additional test likes the nitrates also or the leukocyte trace which are being done which also give us a clue whether she need to be you know uh, further evaluated for 
without symptoms itself whether she needs a culture that is one way or if the resources are very good we can straight away go for the urine culture and sensitivity in the first setting itself and as we have discussed if you are looking at the ideal situation we can do the urine culture and sensitivity in the first trimester yes, that is the okay. first visit okay. and we can repeat at 24 to 26 weeks this is about the high resource settings and if you are looking at only with the midstream uh, urine uh, clean cat sample a uh, simple setting where a urine microscopy is uh, giving us different points of it gives us a guide yeah. and how to treat it how to screen for it i have already mentioned how to treat it uh, uh, at different trimesters different recommendations are there a simple amoxicillin course of 3 days is also good enough to treat it but now since we are going and proceeding with a urine culture and sensitivity it is better to look at the sensitivity and start with the medications okay thank you so chita ma'am um, sometimes in urine test i get uh, less pus cells but high epithelial cells so how to interpret it and what uh, to do ahead with that uh, report in in urine routine if you are sending blood uh, urine for routine examination to a pathologist or if you are doing it yourself with a uh, multi step dip test things to be seen are presence of protein then presence of sugar uh, these are mainly for protein urea because protein urea becomes one of the screening test for hypertensive disorder of pregnancy then next comes pus cells nitrites and leukocytes so if that leukocyte estrays or nitrites or pus cells are significant then as anuja said we need to do culture and treat patient according to sensitivity test if culture is just not possible and you need to treat it then look at if pus cells are there more than 8 to 10 pus cells along with nitrite then this is suggestive of infection a symptomatic infection so you need to treat it so nitrite is really important part along with pus cells and not epithelial cells thank you ma'am thank you anuja next slide please any comment yes ma'am please uh uh the treatment part how many days you have to give the antibiotic needs to be specified and uh, as i had mentioned earlier you have to first rule out whether it is a contaminated specimen or not usually it is contaminated because patients don't take the midstream the first flow of urine carries all the bacteria pus cells epithelial cells whatever is present in the urethra directly into the bottle and that gets tested so that thing has to be cleared first and how many days of antibiotic would anuja like to uh, specify yes, anuja unmute ma'am uh, it is like Three days course of amoxicillin, two fifty milligram twice a day is the basic recommendation which is being discussed. But now, since we are doing this culture and sensitivity, the urologist or the uh, uro uh, physician they are describing a minimum seven days course also. So I think yeah, that is what I wanted to highlight. Usually, we obstetricians have a habit of giving for five days BD or TDS five days. That is the standard, but it does not suffice for. a case of urinary infection especially in a female and in pregnancy so it has to be something beyond 5 days either it is 7 days or 10 days that should be the point to be taken home now one more comment is in case of culture report if you get mixed growth less than 1 lakh usually it is contamination otherwise you you need to take little effort to tell patient that it has to be midstream sample as it is you are spending 4 500 rupees for culture then it, it better goes like a midstream uh, sample but two contaminants less than 1 lakh means contamination and whatever antibiotic sensitivity comes minimum 7 days even if infection is asymptomatic so eradication of infection is very essential there is no need to repeat culture just to see whether there is eradication of infection or not that also i like to mention yes ma'am thank you ma'am um um anu ma'am what precautionary advice to be given to patients with recurrent uti in pregnancy other than increase liquid intake 
yes you have to first tell her that once she has had a uti she is always a candidate for uti so besides her liquid intake personal hygiene is very important we all know that the urethra vagina and rectum all are in line and are in close proximity to each other so contamination fecal contamination post coital contamination is very common her personal hygiene is of utmost importance how to clean after passing stools how to keep her perineal area dry and how to clean after having intercourse drinking a glass of water after having intercourse cleaning private areas before having intercourse all these things have to be insisted upon so personal hygiene and uh, liquid intake in she case. has to pass urine at the very first urge holding urine for a long time especially these days when they are sitting and doing work from home they don't have time to get up and go to the loo these are all reasons for increased uh, incidence of uti in pregnancy okay ma'am thank you so much uh, next at what pregnancy gestations uh, usg is to be done routinely sucheta so, ma'am can you please guide us in this uh, i think anu has answered this question in her presentation very well uh, but in general first scan to be done to confirm viability and dating it can be deferred up to 8 weeks also if there is no suspicion of ectopic pregnancy or no uh, threatened miscarriage so no bleeding spotting no pain you can do scan straight away at 8 weeks again if you want to save on resources this can be still clubbed at 12 weeks but 12 weeks scan i think is absolutely mandatory uh, because it eliminates so many anomalies second scan can be done at around uh, 19 to 20 weeks third fourth fifth and n number of scans can be done depending on whether baby is at risk or no if baby is at risk of uh, fgr and stillbirth yes it has to be done very frequently if mother or the pregnancy has early onset preeclampsia yes again frequently fgdm yes again frequently but mandatory i believe are only first um, trimester that is 12 weeks and 20 weeks later on if at all you are not of very sure of your clinical judgment or patient is not Uh, very much suitable candidate she is too much overweight and overflowing abdomen multiple pregnancies polyhydramnia then you need to increase frequency of scan but the mandatory these first two 12 weeks 20 weeks um anu ma'am uh, this question is for you is growth uh, scan compulsory for all patients growth scan is not compulsory for all patients if you are doing a symphyseo fundal height measurements and plotting because you need some data some figures some curves to fall back on your clinical acumen if clinically you are feeling that baby is growing well you can skip this scan but we like it's very subjective i mean i may feel it is growing well you may feel it is not growing well so we need some objective data so either you plot symphyseo fundal height and see it is growing well if not then at 32 weeks you can do a growth scan because as i told earlier this is the first time the late onset iugr will manifest otherwise if you do straight away at 36 weeks baby is already manifested with late onset iugr and you cannot do any surveillance on that baby so this is an optional scan if you are very much confirmed with your clinical findings if you are doing symphyseo fundal height measurements you can skip it otherwise you can go for it okay ma'am thank you so much ma'am um anuja i would like to your next uh, slide please should doppler be suggested to all patients and when when uh, the era was like you know 5 years back i always believed if there is an fgr or a systemic illness to the mother or a, a high risk like a preeclampsia to the mother then this doppler was suggested to every uh, pregnant now the uh, as the pregnancy evaluation is uh, recommendations are different it has been discussed that even if there is no growth scan uh, error as in if there even if there is no fgr 
still a doppler can predict an earlier changes so the doppler is being done at different levels at an nt scan itself a uterinary doppler is being evaluated so there we are having a pre uh, prediction of preeclampsia risk and then if the uterinary uh, pi is again being followed up at 20 weeks it again gives us an idea you know she's still on the worsening side or no but that is one part then if you are looking at only about the symbol color doppler which we are describing about so uh, ideal recommend ideal uh, thought process was if there is a growth disparity or if there is an fgr then you go for a doppler but I think as Navi Mumbai is practicing, we are all coupling Doppler along with all patients at 32 to 34 weeks. This is what I see. Yeah, routine. Can I take this question, Manisha? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Because ma I, I differ on this. I think we need not specify do Doppler or do only sonography. I think your question implies do we do Doppler in growth scan? Because as Anuja has correctly said, if in a sonographic examination at 13 weeks or 12 to 13 weeks or NT scan, Doppler, uterine artery Doppler is part of it. So Doppler, you are included there. In mid trimester scan, anomaly scan, again, uterine artery Doppler, Doppler technology used for predicting or evaluating uterine artery notches and PI. Doppler is used in mid trimester scan, even in when you are doing cardiac uh, screening for cardiac congenital defects. So again, Doppler is used there. So Doppler is a part of sonography. Only Doppler has no meaning. So I think this question means, I think you want to wanted to ask whether growth scan should be accompanied by Doppler or no. There is no harm in doing Doppler, but always for any test, you need to have an answer why you are doing this. So doing Doppler, if growth is appropriate, carries no meaning. Because if growth is appropriate, if baby is AGA, baby is not SGA, baby is not FGR, growth velocity is good. I mean, she is following, even her weight is following to the centile charts, then there is no point in doing umbilical artery, MCA artery and all that stuff, unless patient is RH, uh, isoimmunized patient, and you are going to evaluate baby because mother is RH negative and probably baby we don't know. But otherwise, just for the sake of it, doing Dopplers is no meaning. If you are ordering Doppler or if sonologist or medicine, fetal medicine person is writing that Doppler values, PIs, you should be able to evaluate it and guide further to the patient. You know, appropriate baby and just because umbilical artery PI is raised and then you advise, you frighten everybody and you advise delivery is not the case. And hence, in all... Uh, European guidelines, in even ISFOC guidelines, even in uh, British or NICE and RCOG guidelines, they say that Doppler is not a screening tool for normally growing babies. Doppler is a screening tool to monitor, to do surveillance on FGR babies. Okay, So for those babies who are at risk of stillbirth, in my presentation I have told you categorization risk, mother, uh, baby high risk, Mother may be high risk or low risk. If baby is at risk, then growth and Doppler is essential. But if not, then Doppler is not mandatory because sometimes it adds confusion and iatrogenic complications. Yes, ma'am. We, we actually, we uh, tend to do Doppler at ninth month just to do a screening sort of thing. But uh, thank you. You have guided it uh, pretty well. The next question is regarding the same thing, ma'am. Next slide, please. Uh, a 19 years primary with no previous significant history of uh, USG lag. Uh, no significant history was there. USG shows lag of three weeks by previous USG. And it also shows utero-placental and peto-placental insufficiency. Mean uterine artery PI is uh, 1.56, umbilical artery PI is 1.13, and MCA PI is 1.23. Increased diastolic flow, cerebro-placental ratio is 1.03. The UAG uh, shows oligohydramnias and uh, uh, fetal weight is 14 point, uh, 1432 grams. So how to go ahead in this patient, how to manage this treatment? Suchita? What is gestational age? 
Ma'am, she she is thirty four weeks. Okay. So who who so you want to answer? Yeah, that, that okay. Okay. Now fourteen thirty two grams. Apparently, it looks very less, but uh, I like to plot uh, the weight on patient's growth chart. And if she is at the tenth centile continuously, and that means she is she is still AGA baby. If she is above tenth centile, but if she is less than tenth centile, then yes, I'll look at all Doppler values. Now umbilical artery PI one point one at that gestational age looks okay. What is MCA PI one point two? It is lower MCA PI, and CPR is still okay. So thirty four weeks. I'll uh, keep this baby under surveillance. I'll repeat Doppler again after one week. Is the scan done by the same person, ma'am? Manisha. Is, yes, ma'am. It is uh, done by the same uh, fetal medicine person only. And, and what uh, is oligohydramnios? Correct. And what is the single deepest pool? AFI or single deepest pool? They have what not is mentioned that? it. They have. So not that means, it. I think then you need to question the. Yes, uh, it's not a very complete report. Okay, ma'am. They have um, uh, in the impression they have given USG shows utero placental and fetal placental insufficiency, and um, actually this uh, case came to one of my friend, and then. Even the fetal medicine person suggested you can uh, give her uh, amino acids and um, deliver her after one week or two weeks after the repeat Doppler. So it was. Manisha, like Manisha I think we need to now uh, develop a habit of reading report rather than just reading the impression. We should be going step wise. What is the weight? What is gestational age? What was the previous uh, sonography report says? Plot on it. If it's growth lag, then look at Dopplers one by one, and then decide. Because empirically treating patients with amino acid has no point. It has to be uh, three answers. Is delivery indicated now? And as I showed in FMF calculator, it is there. Management of SGA babies. You put these values over there and calculate risk, and they'll say that yes, you repeat Doppler after one week, or they'll say consider delivery, or they'll write. Give steroids and deliver urgently. So it depends on gestational age and weight and growth, and then Dopplers. So answer has to be taking into account all these factors. It is not just one single inference. So comparative study with the previous reports and clinical uh, uh, impression is very important. Uh, Our history is I? important. Dr. Manisha, may I? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so I rightly said by Dr. Sucheta and Dr. Anu, Madam, that you have to categorically say any case. You know, first trimester, second trimester, and third trimester you have to divide. First trimester polyhydramnios, second trimester or third trimester, there are different genetic causes, there are different medicinal causes. First trimester IUGR, second trimester IUGR, third trimester. First trimester oligohydramnios, second trimester and third trimester. So definitive etiologies which can be considered, definitive counseling which can be offered to such patients whether they should show you know even after birth. Uh, to uh, you know, pediatricians whether there is an, there is any workup needed or whether there have to be other etiologies which can be considered. So it has to be, and then as Madam said, that index of that uh, amniotic fluid index, which very much impacts decision making in uh, investigation such a child, whether it is genetic or non-genetic, especially seeing you know growth potential of the child, mental outcome of such children. So it helps a lot. Yes, ma'am. Manisha. Yes, ma'am. Manisha. This patient, we need to know uh, what is her BMI, whether any history of hypertension is there in her family, mm -hmm. and whether she is having hypertension in current pregnancy, whether she's on any antihypertensives. Simply 19 years primary is giving me a very vague picture. And all these findings, I have to fit into one diagnosis. All the bits and pieces have to fall into the jigsaw puzzle and make it very true. It's meaningful, isn't okay. it? Got it. Everything Got it. has to explain itself. Every uh, reading, every value has to explain and it, it has to fit into a diagnosis. So Got here, it. I don't know what, what is the BMI of the patient. I don't know what is her history. I don't know what is her present blood pressure, whether she's taking any antihypertensive or not, and how controlled her blood pressure is, whether maternal disease is equally grave as the fetal. Preeclampsia can be two types, maternal and fetal. There is more maternal component in one side and there is more fetal component on one side. Here we 
are just saying the fetal component. We don't know whether the mother is at risk or not. Which category will you put this female into? Low risk mother, high risk fetus or high risk mother, high risk fetus? Yes, yes, ma'am. You understand? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So everything right from the beginning, it, it has to give me a very clear picture what I'm dealing with. Yes, ma'am. A detailed And at case. least I would like to do one more scan, maybe a week or two later, depending on how the patient is controlled, because the growth is not seen in two parameters. You understand? From yes. point A to B, point B, I cannot say growth unless I get a point C also. Then only we can see the growth curve. So at least one more scan is needed to comment. But as you said, she's 34 weeks and these are the parameters and uh, MCA is falling. So maybe we don't have much time in hand. So at this juncture, we might give her steroid and then repeat the scan maybe after a week or so, or maybe early also. What do you, you say, Sujeta? Yeah, very true. Very much true because this is just a half picture and commenting and acting on half picture is not uh, really... I mean, that is as good as treating the report, not treating the patient. So, so, uh, as I said earlier, if on the growth scan, if if she is above, I mean, uh, less than 10 centile and I'm looking at this FGR fetus, then and oligohydramnios, I don't know how much like her because it's a very vague term, oligo. Some people report is eight, uh, AFI also oligo, and some people say even six is enough for this. It's subjective. So it's, it's subjective. subjective. Mm. So you have to have a figure. That is the thing. Now, if, if this oligohydramnios is that AFI is two and only one, one vertical pocket, that two fetal bladder is one centimeter, I will not leave this patient for one week also. Correct. Maybe I'll, I'll give steroids right away, look after 48 hours. Mm. So all factors are important. Since only if you write oligo I'm I'm uh, may consider it as a very mild oligo. I, how do I know it's a severe oligo? So that figure has to be there, and that is the thing, Manisha. I think the, how X-ray technicians take the X-ray, and you see the X-ray chest and say, see yourself and say that yes, there is cardiomegaly or yes, there is pneumonia. So similarly, if the sonography report comes, you look at each and every line, not just highlighted and underlined, you know, and bolds and italics, but you need to go through a report yourself, then you know the history of patient. If not, you can ask the history. And as Anu has very correctly said, put all things in place and then give your opinion. Because this is like, uh, you know, giving opinion on only this piece of information is not good. Exactly. Ma like your child says, Ki, and in hurry, you say, okay, okay, go. So <laughs> that is one inference, but you don't know background information kya hai. You Got have it, to have a complete picture. Got it, ma'am. Got it. Thank you so much for this uh, opening eye-opener uh, conversation, ma'am. Uh, let's, let's go to the next slide. Uh, what detailed vaccination history should be taken for, for a pregnant woman? Like specific history during a pregnant woman. Uh, anu, ma'am, can you uh, please throw light on this? Uh, if if the patient is coming for the first time and she's a primary, so we would uh, try to, uh, I mean, if she remembers all her childhood vaccinations she has taken and the fifth age uh, vaccination at 15 years she has taken, if she remembers, well and good. Otherwise, uh, I don't know whether her mother will remember if she doesn't remember herself. <laughs> But if she is a um, uh, second gravida, she has delivered and the uh, child is around five years or six years, I mean, more than two years, then we know that this lady is already covered with TT, tetanus. She must have taken in her two doses in her previous pregnancy. So this pregnancy you can do with one dose only. And when you're given the choice of one dose, you can give her a boostrix, a Tdap dose. Okay, and in the current pregnancy, we can again ask her whether she has uh, taken flu vaccine or not. If she is coming to you after the first trimester, and if she is following with you, you will know you have given or not. Yes, ma'am. So, um, uh, at what gestation would you recommend TT, TD, or TDAP? See, whenever you give a vaccine, it takes around six weeks for the 
antibodies to develop optimally. So calculate six weeks back from her EDD. And that is the time you should give the second dose, which we give the Tdap. And four to six weeks gap, the TT. So you count back four to six weeks from Tdap, you will get your TT dose. Okay, ma'am. Got it. Um, Anuja, next slide, please. Uh, influenza vaccine for all pregnant women at what gestation? Again, if you are asking me the ideal situation, high resource setting, she should receive a flu vaccine, uh, influenza vaccine as soon as the first trimester is over. Uh, maybe th that 12 to 14 weeks visit when she is coming to us, she can receive the first dose of influenza vaccine. Now, this is about the high resource setting. She can receive another dose of flu vaccine at 36 weeks. At that time, she is supposed to receive this vaccine as well the whole family or whoever is taking care of uh, the patient. Uh, that person also should go for a uh, repeat vaccine at that time. So this is a recommendation with the ideal immunology setting. But if we are not in this situation, we can give this influenza vaccine single shot any time after this uh, first trimester. As Madam has already pointed out, the maximum immunity is like six to eight weeks, but we have to cover the woman also in the influenza. It is not just about the newborn. We are thinking about a, uh, the influenza cover. So now the, this thing is for you, whether you opt it at along with the 14 to 16 weeks or at your anomaly scan visit, it is up to us. Okay. Yeah, basically this vaccine we are giving for pregnant women and first few months uh, of the new net. So ideal time is after completion of first trimester, whether you belong to low or high resource setting. Now even NMMC uh, health centers are giving flu vaccines free of cost. So those who can't afford in private can go and get it there. But I think after first trimester, everyone should get flu shot. In very much ideal situation, pre-pregnancy. And second dose has to be after one year. So if it is in pre-pregnancy, again, her turn comes in during pregnancy period, but then at appropriate time. But just to uh, remember it simply, it has to be one dose after first trimester, any time. Got it, ma'am. But earlier, the better. Got it, ma'am. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, Chita, ma'am, this is for you. Which vaccines can be safely taken during pregnancy and which vaccines to be avoided? All live viral vaccines are to be avoided. I mean, not viral, all live vaccines are to be avoided in pregnancy. And what we are concerned about is MMR vaccine, chickenpox vaccine, and now COVID vaccine. So COVID vaccine that we are getting in India here are not live uh, vaccines. So it, they can be still safely taken during pregnancy. Now leave apart COVID, MMR never to be taken in pregnancy, chickenpox not in pregnancy. There is a variety of flu vaccine which comes as a nasal drop or nasal spray. It is a live virus vaccine, so it is to be avoided in pregnancy. In pregnancy only, inactivated, injectable. Now rest all vaccines that we know about are typhoid and uh, hepatitis A and hepatitis B. All are inactivated or killed vaccines, so they are safe in pregnancy. Nevertheless, that is never a priority for us for any vaccine preventable disease during pregnancy. Hence, routinely we don't recommend these vaccinations during pregnancy. Even HPV, it, I mean, you need not defer HPV vaccine during pregnancy, but again, it's not a priority. So during pregnancy, HPV, we don't give. So as far as we gynecs are concerned in reproductive age group, what we need to remember of only two major things. One thing is uh, influenza vaccine, in first half of pregnancy after first trimester is over. And second is Tdap vaccine. Now Tdap vaccine, again, you can give some any time after first trimester. Ideal is around 20 to 26 weeks of pregnancy. And if she has received complete TT immunization in previous pregnancy, no need to repeat booster as well. So only single Tdap. Now Tdap we are giving for protection against pertussis and diphtheria. So only single dose is required. TT Yes, it is basically for neonatal tetanus, but if mother is going to get delivered at hospital and it's in hygienic settings, for that matter, it gives away the need of tetanus immunization. I think everybody knows that in Western world, there is no tetanus immunization. It's just Tdap. Yes, ma'am. 
thank you ma'am uh, anu ma next slide please um, anu ma'am what if there is a dog bite during pregnancy can we give rabies vaccine yes we can but again the benefit and the risk uh, ratio has to be kept in mind uh, if the dog is vaccinated and it's a domesticated dog then we may do away with giving this but if it is a stray dog then keeping the risk benefit ratio we can give rab this rabies vaccine okay ma'am um, next slide please um uh, ashlesha ma'am this is for you when and how to look for postpartum depression in short some pointers uh, if we could uh, uh, find, um, get and role of relatives in uh, uh, postpartum depression in short ashlesha yeah. ma'am so yeah um so like i said that uh, it's important to actually look for postpartum depression at least a month or six weeks afterwards and here uh, they may no longer come to you so it's uh, maybe if you have identified some risk factors or if you are worried about someone likely to get depressed if there is lots of uh, stresses going on to uh, educate the family the relatives uh, educate them that right now she seems to be doing okay or uh, you know immediately after delivery but after about a month of the baby's birth is when they need to start looking out for uh, you know if uh, she's uh, if her mood is going down uh, one of the things that i often look for is uh, see sleep is anyway disturbed in the postnatal period and uh, but uh, one of the things to ask the mothers is that even when there is nothing to do you know the baby is taken care of the house is clean and everything is cooked even when you have nothing to do are you able to fall asleep are you able to relax and just sleep because when you have nothing to do and that is sometimes depressed mothers are not able to sleep even um, if there is no other pending duty and they are not able to find joy in anything and with the baby they may or may not be they may just be doing things very mechanically so asking about sleep when nothing else is uh, pending asking if they are able to never mind with the baby but anything other thing any activity that relaxes them that they feel like they are able to get joy out of uh, also they may be breastfeeding but they are not eating well uh, so you know if you the first sort of month when breastfeeding has to be established there is like a voracious hunger in most women but in a depressed woman that is not there so asking about these three things are quite important another thing is uh, that uh, if they are not very keen to spend time with the baby not because they don't want to they are not bonding but they just feel very anxious around the baby so if they are uh, not keen to spend time with the baby is another thing to sort of keep in mind so these are the main things to ask for apart from other symptoms of depression that you may or may not ask ma'am a uh, lot many times uh, it happens that uh, um, when the patient is uh, getting a baby uh, of not expected gender like if uh, she wanted a male and she gets a female so during ho her hospital stay um, how can we counsel her or how can we um, pick up the signs of depression or anxiety in her so certainly i mean like i mentioned earlier that if you are able to talk to her privately that is really important often we don't uh, realize that there are too many attenders around so getting to talk to her privately and uh, just uh, not asking leading questions like how are you doing often uh, the focus becomes all about the child but asking them how are they doing and is how does everyone else feel about the baby because if you worried about the gender if you worried about uh, you know that uh, there is a sort of uh, uh unhappiness in the family that it's yet another female baby you might ask you know have people come to visit uh, how are they feeling about the baby how do you feel about this another question to sort of ask is uh, are you worried about anything when you leave the hospital you know is there something that bothers you do you think there'll be something you won't be able to cope with when you leave so those are the kind of open uh, questions you can set the stage and if you feel like she's opening up then you can ask more quel closed questions you know is this a problem now that you've had a female baby and I, i i used to think oh we should not assume these things but uh, i feel like uh, we should ask now because no matter even now there is still a gender bias it still exists in uh, uh, you know all uh, across uh, um socio economic status so it's all right to ask uh, them that if if having a, a gender that they did not want is going to cause a stress and then uh, you might say you know ask them how are they going to cope with it and then say you might give them some resources like uh, connect them to a counselor 
or you might say that if you want you can come back and talk to me and i can find someone you know helpful to talk uh, for you to talk to so you may if you just open up all you may be able to do is just open up the conversation that i understand this might be stressful if you want to i'm here to listen to you and that's all you may be able to achieve before they leave the hospital so if they start noticing more and more stress then when they might come back and then say okay yes i did i feel like now i need to do something about it. got it ma'am got it um suchita so, ma'am this is a common scenario in our um, uh, anc opds that patient comes during a, uh, anc um, and um, she says my mother in law doesn't allow me to take rest or aram nahi karne deti hai madam aap unko ja ke bolo ki mujhe aram karne de all such uh, things so how to counsel um, the patient and the mother in law or whoever the relative is oh so you are asking my secret <laughs> <laughs> no ideal thing is uh, yes you have to be very empathetic with patient uh, at the same time you need to uh, tell them what actually it is pregnancy is not a pathological condition it's a physiological condition in first trimester it does you know because of increased bmr it takes time to cope up now coping up mechanisms are different for different uh, mothers or different patients but you should be active uh, in a day i mean pregnancy is not equal to bed rest which many patients they do believe in but in fact for your own good and for baby's good it's very important that you remain active and working this is to be told to mother i mean the patient now uh, to mother in law all as well as husband we need to tell them that uh, yes pregnancy needs some kind of rest and few mothers they require more rest but what is recommended is at least 7 to 8 hours sleep in the night time and one or two hours nap in the day time which many patients uh, require now many of our patients are working patients working at home working at office but you offer her help where you can so since you cannot offer her help in her office work you cannot make her uh, com- commuting to office easy at least offer a helping hand at home and when she returns from office let her have some snacks let her take some rest and then she'll join back and do her daily work so we need to inform both mother in law as well as patient as well as husband that this is the opportunity to help your wife and probably this is a good time to create a new bond as a family and as a spouse because the way you are handling and helping your wife now during pregnancy she is going to remember life thanks so you have to you know inform uh, the truth science be empathetic and tell whatever is expected from everyone got it ma'am got it thank you um next slide please um snehal ma'am this is for you what are the specific pointers while history taking which will suggest genetic evaluation means in, uh, you can enumerate uh, some points which will uh, give us that yes this uh, uh, patient needs a genetic evaluation snehal yeah, so as we have already discussed in the presentation that you know specific group having those mutations or specific ethnicity consanguinity then previous deaths infertility uh and uh, previous obstetric history and current pre- obstetric history having abnormal screening or abnormal results and especially in current times disorders of sexual differentiation because many of these patients we do not know that you know there are correction surgeries being done and uh, they are taken as infertile so that has also to be kept in mind so with all this history and as you have suggested that if a questionnaire can be made i would make one suggestion that under the auspices of nmogs if we can make one format where uh, we have we can e- evolve a consensus uh, questionnaire or a form which can be uh, filled up by obstetrician or if that is referred to a genetic evaluation which can be filled up and whether we as a uh, you know uh, from navi mumbai can evaluate our performance whether we are picking up genetic uh, cases or risk uh, earlier whether we are doing right investigations where it needed or whether some investigations were not needed and what are the lacunes from doctor side whether we wanted to inform this we had to ask this and we couldn't or whether the cost were a, a cost were a problem what were the problems which deferred evaluation so this all can be evaluated so i think it would be an objective good exercise uh, once i make up that form 
uh, to be shared across your platform and make it as a policy to have at least few first you know 500 or 1000 patients which will give us an objective data and analysis okay ma'am thank you so much and good input so, yes your efforts would be definitely be are appreciated next slide please um snehal ma'am this is again for you which congenital anomalies need genetic evaluation and what investigations to be advised and at what stage of the gestation yes, so multiple congenital abnormalities where you can definitely give them a suggestions that what syndrome it can be uh, any definitive congenital abnormality like increased nt scan in turner syndrome or noonan syndrome any definitive cardiac Uh, abnormality like valvular stenosis or any you know left heart hypoplasia congenital heart disease like the uh, tetralogy of fallow which will give you definitive indicators of genetic evaluation uh, where investigations can be straight away advised now the milder anomalies like left only cleft lip or palate seen on 4d or only you know some of the abnormalities like only ctev only few of the abnormalities which only few contractures or a late onset iugr late onset polyhydramnios where you suggest where you where you uh, see whether there is a mild dystrophy role playing in, in view of previous history in those cases you may not directly advise genetic evaluation but you have to stratify the risk as madam has already said and we have seen that risk stratification and if they fall into high risk groups we have to discuss at that point of uh, trimester or gestational age whether genetic investigation would be are uh, giving any advantage to that patient like you know what are the risk of doing karyotype what is a benefit and what is a limitation of karyotype what is a limitation of nips so every test needs to be discussed first and then only investigation should be advised if there is an if you know if just to allay the anxiety whether we should do the fish or qf pcr or straight away just a karyotype just a karyotype because they have come at 12 weeks and we can wait till 16 weeks for a karyotype whether we needed a fish so these all every test and their limitations have to be kept in mind and then investigations have to be advised so definitely a very severe congenital abnormalities uh, need a genetic investigations but borderline or mild abnormalities even if borderline microcephaly where you have some certain uh, neurosonography markers mri and then further genetics so uh, there are you know case to case basis uh, there is an evaluation needed for milder abnormalities thank you ma'am uh, next uh, next slide please actually i think anu needs to speak on the slide she is very good at all these ma'am next uh, no what snehal has actually covered everything what what my uh, comment From is from obstetrician's perspective anu you tell yes uh, uh, say i would like to advise genetic counseling not for the current pregnancy but for the next pregnancy if the patient wants i need to have some data based on which i will be able to counsel the patient how much of her chances are there in getting the same anomaly in the baby so for that perspective i would like to go for genetic um, uh, uh, analysis of this current pregnancy with the congenital anomaly yes yes definitely before termination whether we want to yes. store sample whether we want to do genetic evaluation or whether you know because most of the times patient just terminate no snehal so even if i have i have terminated the pregnancy i would like to send the products uh, yes, for yes. genetic evaluation yes. at least we yes. will have something on which we can counsel for the patient for her next pregnancy yes and storage and that, is very cheap now storage is very cheap now yeah yeah okay. Got it, so in that case, Nehal, we have an animal child and patient delivers a stillbirth or the live birth, but not about to survive. Then what do you think? What sample can we send? Because she has come out of invasive testing. I mean, invasive testing procedure cost is also added. So which test and which sample should we send in such case? Yes, even if even even in, in cases of stillbirth, uh, stillbirth. So we know that there is an outcome which is which cannot revert. Even in cases where you have uh, anomaly scan showing uh, abnormalities, where you are anyway going to terminate, here I don't uh, su suggest them invasive advice. So wherever yeah. you are anyway going to have an abnormal outcome, you can uh, take tissues of the fetus, uh, you can take fetal end of the placenta, you can take chunk of uh, you know one centimeter of cord. If the fetus is live, you can puncture cardiac or blood. If you can take cord blood. so anything can be taken any tissue in case somewhere you if macerated fetus is going to come out then any tissue can be taken out 
uh, only in cases of severe hydrospitalis sometimes i suggest that if they can take cvs sample because it so comes fragile and bits and pieces mm -hmm. sometimes you may not get a good quality of dna so apart from the severe cases you can take tissues blood uh, or samples of the fetus and uh, extract the dna and store how to send the sample snail so sample can be sent tissue sample immediately uh, into a sterile container with normal saline with few drops of gentamicin or romic acid added and to be kept in the fridge door till the pick up blood if you can get fetal blood or plus uh, you know from placental end or any vessel or heart then blood can be kept for 24 hours um, at room temperature also but seeing our conditions warm conditions we can kept in fridge door for till the time of pick up Thank you and sorry, Manisha, I took your role for a while. No problem, Shyamal. Like, like in the uh, hospitals where we have in the hospitals where we have now coming up DNA extraction facilities is excellent. You know, it, it, it's the DNA extraction can be done minus twenty. It can be stored for many hospitals have laboratories where they have minus twenty refrigerated at institutes. They can can be stored for years. Minus seventy to many many years. Oh, Lilac Lab uh, gives the pre-filled containers. For this purpose, so you Correct. can keep one yeah, or two every containers. Lab, every lab and... gives you, yeah. Every lab gives you a culture medium or a container if if you are planning and if you are already counselled and patients are ready. In case if you they decide on time, uh, you can uh, get your your own sterile container with uh, antibiotics. What is the cost of this DNA storage? Roughly, it is cheap. You said roughly, it is one thousand five hundred to two thousand. You can ask. You know, some many patients. We are, I'm storing at thousand five hundred rupees if they are not at all affording, but they are inclined to do in future. So you can reduce the cost. So I think okay. one thousand five hundred to one thousand. Great. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, anu, ma'am, this is a, a clinic. Situation. Um, previous slide, Pradnya. Um, patient is uh, showing high risk double marker. So to evaluate her further, should we wait for amniocentesis uh, till 16 weeks or should we send NIPT or what all test and investigations will do in this case, ma'am? Uh, what is the gestation you have done your uh, double marker double test? Marker that is at tw 12 weeks with NTS. Yes. So she can be safely taken up for a CVS sample because it is beyond 11 weeks. And after 11 weeks, we can do CVS. And CVS, if you do within 48 hours, you can get the FISH report so that at least your uh, chromosome 21, 13, 18 are ruled out. Okay, ma'am. So this would be my first uh, suggestion. But if the patient is really scared of an invasive test, then we can counsel her for an NIPT. But at the same time, you will have to tell her that this again is a screening test, but with more sensitivity, around 99% sensitivity. But still 1% chance will be there that the baby may come Downs positive, even if the test is showing Downs negative. So if you have wasted so much of time that you have crossed over to 15 weeks, then you don't have any option but to go for an MU and then do the uh, fish or karyotype. Okay. So if it is MU, then go for fish and karyotype. If it is before, uh, before 15 weeks, we can offer her NIPT or CVS. No. Yes. It is not just a matter of weeks. Can I say something? Yes, ma'am. See, Manisha, you said that her double marker test is suggestive of high risk for Down. Yes. Okay, or high risk. High that risk. means and it is a combined test. So if NT scan, nuchal scan is absolutely normal. NT is normal and all ductus and tricuspid and everything is fine. Probably she is high risk because of her uh, FAPE or HCG values or a mom values. Yes. Then in that case, I think NIPT, if affording patient, can be offered safely because to some extent, you are sure that it's going to give you a reassurance of trisomy or telling you that uh, baby is trisomy. Uh, because CVS pose howsoever little risk of miscarriage. Now, the patient whose PAPE values are so less to give high risk for Downs are as it is prone for miscarriage. So you, may, you need to make it quite clear to the patient that as it is, there is a possibility of miscarriage with this report. There is a possibility of Down syndrome or whatever aneuploidies. So I, NIPT will save you on from invasive testing and give us true results. Nevertheless, NIPT normal means there is no trisomy, but still pregnancy is at risk of 
miscarriage i have seen this incidences happening that nipt is normal trisomy ruled out and patient miscarried spontaneously so just that in this particular situation cvs ka blame nahi lagega ki lesion dala aur miscarriage hua as it is jo miscarriage hona hi tha wo ho gaya hai because her pape values are so less that means that placenta presentation is so bad or pregnancy in all has no future so we have to be very careful while uh, counseling regarding the cases it should be case based and there is no rule like less than 15 weeks and more than 15 yes very there is true. no rule and there is no rule of affordability also nowadays because nips is so cheap nowadays it's around 15000 you have to press the laboratory they are all accepting samples they have decreased the cost especially in pandemics so you have to discuss the cost Correct. benefit limitation of interpretation it's not and then cvs also it have to be kept in mind the lower placenta if the person is doing uh, very skillful then he can do otherwise they have to do per vaginally and then you know a lot of pain sometimes during that cvs if the placenta is on the lower side they cannot do a per abdominal so all these things per case to case basis we have to discuss about nips and cvs in such patients now having said that nipt still can uh, reassure us that this baby is not trisomy but so many other minor uh, you know defects and the uh, yes. problems yes. are not detected by nipt which can be told only by karyotyping and karyotyping. Um, whatever molecular got it ma'am thank you so much ma'am um, um suchita ma'am the next question is again for you uh, birth plan what is the best time of gestation that we should discuss it uh, with the uh, pregnant woman uh, if she is a low risk mother and low risk baby then uh, somewhere at the end maybe at around 32 to 34 weeks we need to discuss if she has a risk of threatened preterm labor because of her previous experience previous history or history of precipitate labor then we need to discuss with them possibility of preterm labor and tell them that be prepared in case you need to spend time energy and money in nicu thing so that is to be discussed uh, at quite earlier time like at around 28 weeks but uh, i don't know whether there is a universal correct time to discuss birth plan anu ma'am uh, your opinion please ma'am um see usually patients go to their native places in the seventh month in our cultures yes ma'am so that is the time i would say that just ask where she wants to deliver uh, if she wants to go how she wants to travel if she has anybody uh knowing a good hospital over there so all these things may be at that particular time but otherwise it is case to case uh, based depending upon how much risk the patient is carrying as a mother as, as well as as the babies got it uh, next slide please um snail ma'am this is for you how when should uh, you screen for gbs and how to treat it it's big thing but uh, in short if we can discuss about this what is gbs cullen barre syndrome ma'am oh yeah. i didn't know okay. short forms ma'am short forms it was for group b streptococci not group b streptococci ah, streptococci in obstetric <laughs> i got this uh, question from the uh, president itself and i took it as gullen barre syndrome gullen barre why we need, we need to screen we did <laughs> <laughs> sorry for my misinterpretation so um, i would uh, suggest the clinician anuja uh, can you speak on this uh you be strict okay i am not routinely doing it and i think recommendations have also said it need doesn't need to be uh evaluated so basically in our practice if a lady is having a risk of preterm labor we can go for a vaginal examination and if there is any abnormal discharge we can treat for it or we may can take a culture and treat it but this gbs uh, group b streptococci a routine protocol of screening is not there in our country i do not know i have not read it recently about it also anu ma'am this is this is basically done in those centers which do not give antibiotics for a vaginal delivery and who discharge the patient after vaginal delivery within 24 hours 
so they need to see whether an antibiotic cover is to be given or not and after counseling the patient they will take a rectovaginal swab test if the bacteria are there and they prescribe antibiotic before the patient is discharged and some signs and symptoms to be looked into the baby after 2 days or 48 hours because they discharge within 24 hours so it is not applicable in our centers we are routinely giving at least one shot of antibiotic so the whole purpose of doing this test is futile i want to say something group b this group b streptococcal screening is not an entity encountered in our country so i think thankfully because of bb being indian we have some advantage at least ek screening to bach gaya hai humse but it doesn't mean that uh, we should give antibiotic normal delivery vaginal deliveries uh, they don't require antibodies no, uh, sorry antibiotics neither to mother nor to baby it's not recommended unless it's a operative vaginal delivery uh, sorry operative delivery that is c section or some instrumentation is done and there are lacerations or something if there is cps i mean there are indications for giving antibiotic antibiotic but episiotomy or vaginal delivery doesn't warrant any antibiotic treatment to mother or baby if there is premature pre labor rupture of membranes and delivery doesn't happen within 18 hours then baby is screened for infection and only then antibiotic is given to baby so we should not be giving antibiotic to mother or baby just because gbs testing is not done got it ma'am uh, ma'am next question is for uh, ashlesha ma'am um, some pointers about pre conception counseling some specific points we can include during uh, pre conception counseling yeah thank you for that so definitely one of the things to ask for is there is any mental health history uh, in the patient Uh, even in the past, if they have taken medications in the past, or if they have consultant uh, uh, mental health uh, professional, psychologist or psychiatrist, because the chances are that if there is any stress that might occur during pregnancy, uh, or if there are any medical complications, uh, some of those uh, symptoms returning may happen. Uh, also, if they are on any current medication, uh, to not stop the medication suddenly, to actually find out from the uh, psychiatrist whoever is prescribing. Uh, if they are aware that this uh, person is uh, you know planning a pregnancy or not uh, also one of the questions that i tend to ask is uh, uh, you know are they like are you know who wants this pregnancy who is uh, are they interested in getting pregnant right now often it is a you know motivation of someone else that they should be getting pregnant and when they are planning the pregnancy uh, you know is it clashing with something at work because sometimes women are expecting a promotion and uh, you know family is on another uh, plan altogether they want them to get pregnant right now so it it's important to and sometimes they'll say ha huh, let's just go and talk to the doctor and uh, so they are not yet ready for pregnancy they may have other uh, priorities so it might be a question worth asking you know uh, uh, w- what are your plans who wants this pregnancy right now and uh, how are you going to manage it if you have other priorities in your life what is your plan to manage it sometimes asking that question is quite useful because um, everyone assumes the husband assumes that uh, you know yeah it's been a few years since you got married nobody actually asks the woman if she wants to get pregnant now, right now or not so it's quite important to ask those questions um, like i said earlier that if they are on any medication is to important not to stop anything suddenly because there is a risk from them becoming unwell so just highlighting that if there is a history of mental illness now we have enough support enough evidence to manage pregnancy with uh, medication there are lots of medication that can be given that are low risk uh, so we need to balance out the risk from the illness with the risk from the medication and see which is the best optimum combination for you so don't stop anything suddenly let's seek advice let's work together with whoever is looking after your mental health and so that they don't feel like they have to hide it from you or they have to hide it from anyone uh, that you are going to work with their uh, uh, mental health professionals and you're not going to stigmatize like the care will continue even if they have mental illness or not mm. so those are the main things to keep in mind thank you so much ma'am 
and uh, um, it was uh, i think i am on the last slide of saying thank you thank you to all the panelists for their uh, valuable time and such a good discussion uh, all clinical uh, discussions and updating even about gbs also <laughs> thank you so much it was a very nice uh, time to be spent with thank, thank you manisha thank, thank you. you manisha and all the thank panelists. you manisha Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Can I ask one question, ma'am? Yeah, yes. yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, I have uh, so many patients of leukoria in pregnancy and uh, fungal skin infections. How can we manage, ma'am? Leukoria in pregnancy is just simple physiological white discharge. But if they complain is... of itching, yeah, itching. See, any thing which keeps your perineum wet, whether it is physiological or pathological is going to give you itching. So first you distinguish whether it is physiological, normal, or it is uh, pathological. During pregnancy, there is more tendency to have a more discharge, but which is physiological discharge. But you, once you have distinguished, then this discharge can be taken care of by frequently changing your panties, using panty liners, keeping the perineal area dry with antifungal powders. And mostly you have to reassure that this is normal and you cannot give her medication to stop anything which is normal physiological because of the pregnancy. So once you have uh, reassured the patient, most of the patients settle down. Pathological, yes, you have to treat the patient, syndromic management, both of the patient and of the partner, and uh, teach her the personal hygiene, how to keep her perineal area clean so that these things are not repeated, the recurrence is prevented. And what about tinea infections if they have uh, in groins, in axilla, sometimes on hands? They have. Uh, uh -huh. if, if the patient comes in first trimester, local creams, antifungal you can give. After first trimester, you can safely give fluconazole 200 milligram depending on the severity, twice a week or weekly, maybe for a month or two, along with the local applications. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Welcome. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, Manisha, for excellent panel. And thank you, Mr. President, Dr. Vani, for <laughs> wonderful CME. Good. Thank you, thank you all. Thank okay. you, Manisha Matkar, ma'am, for moderating the panel discussion. Thank you to all the panel experts. Uh, thank you to our organizing committee, Dr. Rahul Vani, sir, Dr. Santosh Jaibai, sir. Thank you for all the uh, speakers for taking on the valuable time for us today. Thanking Lilac Insights, Nopex, and Signura for supporting the webinar today and all the wonderful delegates for uh, accompanying us till 2 o'clock for this exhaustive yet very informative and wonderful webinar. Thank you all. Thank you. Rahul. 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 We are here. Rahul, sir. Yes, Rahul, are you there? Yeah, just tell about the next CMEs to everyone. So uh, 19th, 19th June, uh, we are having on uh, oncology. 26th will be around menopause, uh, HRT and uh, those things. And 4th uh, July, we have on basics in uh, investment, wealth <laughs> account. 11th, 11th July, we are having the first trimester uh, complete. Uh, uh, first good, trimester good. Screen and all those. So Rahul, you are making us study like anything. <laughs> <laughs> Extensive <laughs> course. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. Well, all the best. Thank, Thank you. you so much, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, Pratya, for a nice coordination and uh, comparing. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I conclude the session. Thank you, everyone. Meeting at Karan.